Yeah. Happy spring. Good evening. I call the, do I call the meeting to order and then the hearing? Yeah. So I will call the school committee meeting to order. And I will open the school choice hearing. And I announce, I will be presiding over this public hearing today on school choice. The purpose of this public hearing is to invite comments from members of the public regarding the school choice hearing that is pending before this school committee. The committee will hear comments from persons present who wish to speak for, against, or neither for nor against school choice. Once the public hearing has commenced, there can be no motions or votes until the hearing has officially concluded. The chair will entertain a motion to open the public hearing on school choice. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Gambino no aye. Stores aye. Modell aye. Kablotsky aye. 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 Very good. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak in favor of school choice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good timing. Good timing. Go ahead. Good timing. Announce yourself, please. Well, t give us your name and your My street name is address. Steve Perlman. I live at 377 Baldwin Road. Carlos. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. But You're right on time. Carlisle still. does not currently have a school choice program. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, I feel very strongly that uh, we teach our kids, as I understand it, uh, diversity in schools and respect for other cultures. and. Uh, I think it's essential. My, my kid went to, he's 28 now, but he went to Carlisle School. And uh, I still tell the story about him uh, when we uh, were ready for college. He was 17 and he wasn't really doing it. So I started asking him questions. And I said, you, what do you care? Do you, do you care about the sports teams? Yeah, I care. It's got to be a, a Division One school I want to go to. I said, I said, what about diversity? He says, no. I said, no? What do you mean, no? He said, I want, I want to go to school with kids like me. Well, it's because he, didn't go, to <laughs> he yeah. didn't go to school with kids that weren't, you know, white or, or some Asians. And I mean, we have some diversity in town. I don't want to say we don't, but uh, it's pretty limited. But certainly not much economic diversity. So, anyway. That's my opinion. I I don't think I need to uh, give any details, but I feel strongly that we ought to do it. Thank you, Steve. Are there anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of school choice? Would anyone from the public wish to speak in opposition of school choice? Would anyone wish to speak neither for nor against, but offer additional information on school choice? Having heard all comments, oh, oh, boom, boom, Mr. Valentine. Yes, um, we will review sort of cohort projections and where yes. the school is going um, after this. But I think one of the issues the school will be wrestling with is the possibility of declining enrollment over the next five, ten years. And then how do you build a sustainable school so there could be an argument made just from that perspective of providing no choice. But that's obviously an empirical question. Good, good comment. Any more comments? Having heard all comments, the public hearing on school choice is now closed. I entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Gambino aye. Stores aye. Modell aye. Kablotsky aye. Leary. Very good. The hearing is closed. Okay. Uh, we can now move to public comments that are more along the lines of school committee issues, not school choice. Are there any comments tonight? Okay. We, we now uh, will move to the review and approve the minutes of March 20th and March 27th, 2019. To approve the minutes of March 20th and 27th, 2019. Second. Uh, any comments, discussion? Just a big fat thank you. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nancy's mm -hmm. getting good at it. She needs a little seasoning, but we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. Okay. I need Nancy one small. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 
So no further discussion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 And that's our approved. Okay, now it is my sort of, what do they say, schadenfreude, right? The uh, sort of sad and pleasurable at the same time. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we, want to, uh, we want to note that today is the last uh, meeting of both Josh and Mary at Carlisle School Committee. They might have a residual in the region, I'm not sure. I thought we don't accept them. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, so um, I have a few remarks, but uh, before I do, um, Anyone, does anyone wish to say anything? Go ahead, Josh. A few words. Sure. Uh, prepared. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served our community. When I ran for school committee nine years ago, I was motivated by my conviction that if you don't get involved and try to create the change you want to see, you have no standing to complain. I guess you could say I joined the school committee so that I could complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> in all seriousness, I believe our town and our school is excellent in no small part because of the time, energy, and expertise of volunteers. Everyone in our community has something to contribute, whether it be in raising money for CEF or PTO, the important critical work of school advisory committee, the coaches, chaperones for our children's activities, the volunteers in our classrooms, on the playground, lunchroom, or the citizens who serve our town in other ways, whether appointed or elected to town committees, everyone has something to contribute. I encourage all to contribute and participate in our community. While private donations do wonderful work, having created amazing spaces and programs for our children, it is the involvement of individuals that builds community. While I don't always agree with every decision in this town, I'm proud of this community. To the extent that we encourage debate and diversity of opinion, we not only make better decisions, but also create a more inclusive process. To the extent that when we disagree, we do so with respect and civility, we honor our shared interest in our school, our town, and one another, creating community. As parents, we play an important role in our children's education in so many ways. One role that is often and easily overlooked is that we model behavior. I believe it would move our society in the right direction if parents everywhere modeled community service and respect for diversity of opinion. I'm proud to be part of a community that often evidences these traits in abundance. We and our school district are fortunate, not only because of the community we are part of, but also because of the many people who have dedicated their careers to educating our children. I have been impressed with the dedication and commitment, professionalism and expertise of our faculty, staff and administration. I thank you all. This district has its challenges ahead. I believe in tackling challenges head on, and that is what I hope the district will continue to do after my departure. I leave with full faith in the district and with respect and admiration for the many who serve it. I'm looking forward to hearing great things. Thank you, Carlisle, for the opportunity to serve. Thank you, Josh. Um, well, I, I, I have to say, serving with both Josh and Mary has been um, incredibly helpful. Um, the, the best thing about Josh is that he just doesn't let us all say yes to everything. He makes us think, and he makes us really um, think both short and long term about what we are discussing. And I, think that, I hope that we can maintain that when you're, when you're not with us. Um, and I've worked, huh? He's no longer in the He's not going to um, well, he will eventually, but anyway, um, I, I worked more closely with Mary in the last year on the uh, regional school committee, and uh, I sit in awe of Mary Storrs. I think that she um, really advocated for um, our children at the high school, but she advocated for our town every single time she was with us in the school committee meetings and in between, and in a lot of ways that, like Josh, it would be easy to just let things slide, but she, uh, she kept people to task and to the law, and she was um, a, an absolute joy to work with and a real inspiration on what a school committee member should be. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Well, I've, I've only had the opportunity to work with Mary and Josh for a short time, but um, I've really enjoyed the time that we've worked together. Uh, Mary, you have a great interpersonal style, and 
um, you bring good insight and perspective and ideas to the conversation. And um, so I really thank you for that. Thank you. And Josh, well, <laughs> I, I also really appreciate um, what you bring, the, your expertise in business and process. Um, also, your tenacity in keeping positive educational outcomes at the forefront of, of all of our discussions and decision making, um, and reminding us how important it is to involve the community in our work and to you know, incorporate the parent perspective as we're discussing things. So, thank you. Say anything? I'm waiting. You're waiting. I'm waiting for this. You're waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it all in. This is awesome. Melissa, you want to? You can get a recording. You, you can go first. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right. <clears throat> I've been fortunate to have served almost two terms on the school committee, a school committee that was rich in insight and experience. Important legacy knowledge was passed from Bill Fink and Melissa McMorrow to the present committee. And I was able to collaborate with Mary and Josh on a number of issues critical to the Carlisle schools. Now it is time for Josh and Mary to move on. And hopefully, Christine, Melinda, and I have absorbed some of their knowledge as we welcome two new members next month. Uh, what is less tangible but more critical is their wisdom and judgment. Both Mary and Josh excel in that area, and I will miss both of them. From Josh, who has served as my vice chairman this year, I have come to value his abstract way of framing an issue apart from the specifics of the situation and from a perspective that turns a tactical decision into a strategic one, which is precisely what a school board should be doing. As Josh has said, and I'm paraphrasing, the school will run just fine this year, next year, and probably for another year no matter what we do. But how it runs a decade from now is very much our job. Josh's long service to the town on school committee is matched by his work on long-term caps and municipal facilities committees, both of which reflect his long-term vision to keep the town strong for many years to come. In a way, Josh's approach to the physical condition of the town's assets is an analog to his work on school committee, making sure the bones of the town are healthy and well cared for, but leaving the day-to-day -to, -day to the professional staff. So Josh, I know you got five children, but you will no doubt pick up some free time in your sabbatical. Yeah. I hope to. And I, we appreciate your long service and wish you good sailing ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mary has been a chair, a vice chair, and a long service serving representative to the region. I often bounce ideas off of her, off her. Her, her perspective and common sense approach has been invaluable to me. Mary has served on both the K through 8 and the regional committees long after her son Teddy was graduated. She's been a real trooper or maybe just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> During Mary's time on the region, she has upheld Carlisle's position as an equal, if minority, partner. Hard work that is often unheralded but not unnoticed by this committee, as echoed by some of the comments. Mary is moving to the lovely town of Newburyport, so we're not only losing a valued committee member but also a Carlisle citizen. Hopefully, however, we are not losing a friend. So thank, thank you very you. much, Mary. Thank you, Dave. Thank okay. you. Um, I, I would like to say something. Um, I like to laugh at these meetings. I tend to bring my sense of humor. I do that at work and I do that here. But I take this job very seriously. And um, I hope I've been able to do good things for nine plus years. And um, I, you know, you mentioned my son, he only graduated last year from the high school. But, but I think it's important to have a number of perspectives on the school committee. So I think it's, it's actually been kind of helpful for me to step, having gone through K through 12, be able to step back and say, this is what was good about that experience and, and what we can do as a committee. So I have learned a ton. I've made a lot of amazing friends. And um, I can't go as far as to say I'm going to miss these meetings. Um, <laughs> but um, I will miss this community. I will really miss this community. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to miss you, Mary. Thank you. Walk away and you forget. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Melissa McCarroll, 301 Concord Street. Um, I served with both Josh and Mary for six years, uh, but that pales in comparison to their nine and nine and plus two month uh, tenure. And I really think this is a, a little bit of an end, an end of a era for the committee and the school um, with a lot of bright future ahead. Um, but uh, to Josh, um, Thank you really for keeping us focused on having our eye on the prize and the long-term prize. I mean, when I came into the school committee, I think you had a little bit of a reputation as a rebel. A little? <laughs> um, Me? And, um, and I appreciated that. I, I came to really appreciate it and really um, feel challenged by it. And, and we made many, decisions for the better because of that view that you brought to the to the world except when i have to get a policy finished <laughs> yeah <laughs> Fair no but but in all seriousness um we really are a better school system because of the perspective you brought and um i think something that goes unnoticed to a lot of people in this room and to a lot of people in the community is the pers that you have brought that perspective to the, to serve the town and um, we are all grateful for that too as well. And many, many municipal facilities, communities, <laughs> and long term caps meetings, and, and again, the long term view. So thank you, Josh. I really you appreciate much. it. Um, Mary Stores. Um, people have said a lot of the things the wisdom, the judgment. Um, I think one of your enduring legacies will be your um, strong conviction that people who serve on this committee should not come with an agenda. Um, and I think mm -hmm. I think you have set that tone for nine years and I hope Good. that that continues. Um, I can say of this committee that um, I never felt that anyone brought their personal agendas to the table and um, it's in large part because of that view that you consistently mm -hmm. said publicly and privately. And so, there's so many things I can say to you, Mary, but that, I think, is your enduring legacy. Thank you. Um, in addition to bringing your mind and your heart to this job. Um, but I would be remiss if I did not mention uh -oh. all of the teacher appreciation lunches. <laughs> yes. All of the recess duty. I opened a lot of cartons of milk in this place. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> all of the lunch duty. Yeah. All of the Read Across America days. Um, and what am I forgetting, Catherine? I'll let you chime in, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, That's I know what I'm forgetting. Cross country. Cross country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Did anyone else have any comments? Uh huh. Hi. Yes. Hi, uh, Catherine Frank Daniels Lane. Um, my husband, Bill, who was on the school committee, cannot be here tonight. He's traveling home from a trip, but he wanted to make sure both Josh and Mary. Uh, hear his thanks from him to um, just thank both of you for your time on the committee. He enjoyed working with both of you and wishes you both well in your retirement. <laughs> um, so best wishes from Bill. And then as a mother in the town of Carlisle with three children, one still in school and two that have graduated, uh, to thank everybody on the committee, um, but tonight particularly Josh and Mary for the efforts that they put in on behalf of all of the children of the town. Uh, past and present, uh, the, the efforts of this committee, particularly on the impact on lives of the children in the town, is just tremendous, so thank you all. And from a, on a personal level, Mary Stores is a good friend of mine. Um, I have opened many milk cartons with Mary, peeled <laughs> oranges with a spoon. In fact, I had to learn how to do it so we could teach the kids. So from the very first day of kindergarten until my twins graduated with Mary's son, Teddy, um, my son in middle school now um, is also terrified of Mary on Gabriel. Come on, that makes you very So thank you uh, for both for for your tremendous effort on behalf of all of us. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. On behalf of the district, we have a few gifts for you. First, I'm going to start with Mary. Um, and the good news is Melissa won't be jealous because it's very similar to what Melissa said. Oh. 
But Mary, everyone says such eloquent words about you and your service in nine years has been incredible here and your wisdom and your advocacy for our students and for our arts programs and your involvement in you were involved with the Spalding Building and all of that. So on behalf of the whole district, we have a tote that's filled with party gifts. Thank you. With a Carlisle logo on it. So enjoy that. Oh, awesome. You're packed you. up and you're ready to go for your new you condominium. You don't need that leather bag anymore. That's really great. Oh. <laughs> and then Mr. Kablotsky, on behalf of the district, I'd like to thank you. You all spent nine years of service. Um, and everyone else framed it very similarly. You have a, your own singular way of encouraging you know, continuous growth in both the district and the educators and myself, and I really appreciate that and the idea that you keep, you know, Carlisle's preeminence and uniqueness in the forefront of your work. So, that on behalf of the district, I'd thank you also. Thank, thank you. you. And you get similar. Oh, for the vote. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Valentine, <laughs> would you like to present? Do you have a stick or something? To and I served on a couple of uh, Highland committees with Mr. Valentine. Oh, Are you already in? Is it already up there? Oh, no. um, so uh, Nancy is. Nancy is uh, right, John's so presentation. Dennis, get his up. I have. Um, I don't believe I actually have a slideshow of yours, John. I have. I can switch it in there, but it's it's. Uh, there it is. It's kind of like a. That's the PDF. The PDF, okay. Yeah. So let me just preface. Um, John gave this presentation about two weeks ago, I think, uh, right here, and I was really impressed with it. John's been a long time uh, kind of data geek for the town, among other things, and uh, his presentation. I'm listening. I'm listening. I was very impressed with this presentation. I thought we would benefit from it. I'm so glad he's presenting it because this was a lot to read. Yeah. yeah. A lot to absorb. Okay. Dave, I sent one to you that yep. was posted on the. Uh, yeah, Nancy. We, yeah. yeah. Just that's got the details because I wanted to dig into cohorts a little bit. Yeah. So you guys. Did you know that? You can send it to me. I just have a PDF. It's on the website. It's on the website. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. As a PDF? No, as a PowerPoint. At least I sent it to David. Yeah, I went no, back. I sent it. Nancy got it. Yeah. She might have PDF'd it for the um, yeah. website. John, what's the website? It's yours. Post on our website? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, good. I think so. Correct? Dave's oh, like a master plan. It's all part of the show. This is normal technology. I, yeah, should, right. I should know better as a teacher that you always got to come in with your You should always come with your stick, but yeah, I thought right. we had that to post, right? But I think it's on the master plan. Um, no, because no, I added tailored. some, we, we oh, did some editing and we added he, a couple he of... He tailored it for this thing. Not the one yeah. that starts Carlisle Trends Demographic. No, 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 this is... This no, no. Nancy, is it on the website? I didn't put it on the website except in the packet. I, I can get it because Dave sent it to me first. No. no. So I'll just give a preface before, before we get up on this. Um, I started uh, this this project back when we were at the school. We were trying to figure out where to build a school, and so this was when we were looking at Banta Davis. And at that point, the population was going over 800 students, and so we thought we'd have to build a whole new school in Banta Davis. And as you know, there were several studies of trying to figure out where to locate the school. And so I, I was involved with Beth Hamilton and Nancy Pierce in this uh, uh, document, which I forget, I forget who I did this for, but, uh, um, but anyway, it was basically looking at growing pains and the idea that Carlisle's, you know, adding all these schools and what's the impact going to be in terms of taxes and enrollment and everything else. And at that point, I just f fell into sort of the cohort analysis, which is what the high school and Jerry Missile did back in the um, turn of the century, 20 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and so then I sort of learned the cohort analysis of what he did, and then looked at that as how that affected Carlisle. And what you're gonna see, and what I'll go through with a lot of detail, is how that cohort analysis is quite variable in Carlisle because of uh, the number of families that are here, and childbearing mothers that are here, 
which has been declining, and the number of houses that turn over, which bring in new kids, and that very much affects what's going to happen in the future. And so, and and the and being an economist and a statistician, the whole point is the the law of small numbers is there's lots of variables. And so that creates a lot of challenges in terms of managing enrollment and what you guys go through on a year-to-year -year basis of what's the size of school going to be next year and in what grades and things like that. So I think we're... And so, and then Verna Gilbert and I have just continued doing this because we're little nudges and we basically <laughs> decide we want to keep collecting the data and doing it and updating it and then periodically it's, it's been useful. There it is. Should I dim the lights a little bit? Uh, yeah, dim the lights a little bit. Dennis, can we see what That's good. I'm not good at following directions, John. Keyboard assistant shift. You're looking for that key on your remote. Thanks to your remote as a keyboard. Oh, really? Yeah. Done. There we are. Okay, so I've been here a long time, um, and back at the turn of the century, Carlisle was really happy to have uh, parents with no kids come into town because the school had all been growing. So actually you wanted people like myself and my wife and our dog. And now it's just the opposite. We want families with kids because the population of the school is going down. And that and that and we go through cycles. And those of you who've lived a long time know that we go through cycles and we've seen schools turned into um, nursing homes and things like that. So um, the big issue is we're, for the next 10 years 10 to 15 years we're getting older and then baby boomer, boomers like myself and other people will move out of Carlisle or move on. Um, I didn't say that. <laughs> so the issue for the schools is that probably in, in the article in the Mosquito, it will go Rome will go up and down, but for the next 10 years it's biased on the downside. And that's a big concern from the sustainability of the school and everything else and also in terms of the size of the town and how many people move here and stay here and how many people move into new homes and all home, older homes. As you know, taxes have gone up 30% over the last eight years with the two school projects. From a point of view of capital planning, we tried to phase them in. It didn't happen that way. We had two school projects happen at the same time. $100 million of debt was added, and that's, that's significant. So this is a sort of longer term, the master plan, but really from the school's perspective, it's the same set of issues. How do you build a sustainable program when you've got these variabilities in terms of population and class size? So here is the issue is the 25 to 40 year olds, 1990, 1600, now we're in the, you know, mid 500s. The census, the 2018 census, is our census, so it tends to be under responded to. So, you know, they don't have, so the numbers there are a little suspect. But nonetheless, this is the prime childbearing age. And the basic pattern in Carlisle is people who've been to Carlisle have one child, and then the second child is generally over half the children born in Carlisle's mothers over 40. So that's their second child. And so that's the demographic of what's happening. So the fact that we have fewer child, we can divide that by half, we can say that's more or less the childbearing women that you have here. Obviously, they're women over 40 who are childbearing. And uh, so that's a significant issue is when we look at births in Carlisle, is how many births in Carlisle. And the other thing, and I, I do it as over 65, the census gives us uh, that, is this is the people that are probably going to retire and this is growing, and over the next 10 years, it's going to grow, and we're going to certainly have the whole issue of what do we do of aging in place and what happens there. So you've got a, a really a bifurcated distribution. The bigger issue is, of course, what's happening in Massachusetts. So Carlisle, you can't be looking in isolation. Here's the, um, the older population growing as a percent, and here's the working age population declining. 
And so this gets into housing issues, this gets into work issues, and there's a whole bunch of issues. It's what's gonna, how are we gonna keep kids that graduate from college staying here and working? And will they come out here and be in Carlisle, or will the jobs be in the Boston area? And so this is a, a big deal, and it's significant. As you know, there are not a lot of businesses out in the, uh, on 495 that we fall. So this is the distribution by age. School age population stayed more or less the same. Of course, they're actually in high school, not here, so that there's been a shift in what's happening. And here's our drop in our in our childbearing uh, families and the aging population. Okay. Here's when everybody was freaking out. We thought the school was going to go to over a thousand. We had to build a bigger, you know, school up in Manta Davis, and then lo and behold. Through some of the work that I did and other people, when we looked at it, we decided, oh, no, it's actually going to decline, and it makes sense to add onto the campus here. And so that was a long debated process. Here we are now at the 600 level. That's a pretty big decline and very hard to manage. And I think some, I mean, you all know how difficult it is to manage, but often a lot of other people don't really understand that. Um, and so, and I think the concern is, how far down will it go, and what's the sustainable level you want in terms of programs, and how do you run them? And that is not simple and easy. Okay, so here is um, what we've got here is I'm breaking down births and move-ins. Number of people coming into this cohort analysis, how many kids are born here, and how many kids come in with move-ins. And so there's a separation here. This is the, the births are in the, uh, the, the gray and the orange, and it was over 40 during the, up to, in, up to, you know, 2003, 2040, up to 2004, and then it's dropped to under 30. And so you're having fewer than 30 children born. And those children, basically four years, five years from now, enter kindergarten, first grade, and then the people who move in, which is the blue lines, those move in in all different grades. So we have to track where they are. Some move, come and move in and they're in the pre-K and some are in the K through eight. And so that's um, what I'm gonna show you and that is very variable. Um, and, that's, that's, and that's what I wanna kind of go through and it's very much tied to, here's what we're talking about. The cohort model, you have more or less now, we have about 30 born and then we have a, a, a number moving into the preschool and then moving into the high school. Look at how variable. You know, 2008, you had a, nobody moving into K through eight. Net, a net nobody. Net. Yeah. And I'll show you how this, um, and then it's 18, and then in the preschool it's 15. So what happens, and this is what you have to track, is how many kids are born, who comes into the preschool, we track them and put them in a cohort, an age group, and then we see who comes in into the K through eight, because people see Carlisle's got schools, they want to move here, and then they get scattered in all the different grades. Now I'm going to jump ahead and show you what Verna and I do, or Verna do. Uh, so, here is what, and there's that 15 number preschool. I know you probably can't see this, but we had 92 homes sold in 2017. So you got 24 kids moving in into preschool, and you had nine moving out. So what happens is you sell your home, you're moving to Concord, you move to Newburyport or someplace like that, and you leave. And so that leaves a net 15 coming in onto, into preschool. And then you have the K through eight, which is 27 minus 10. That gives you a net change of, of 17. And what I do is I've tracked this over 25 years, so I have averages because you have a lot of variable. I haven't done standard deviations and all that, but I obviously could. Um, and so then you add these two together, that 17 plus the new home, we had nine new homes, but only one child <laughs> came in in the K through eight. So we add 17 plus one, we get 18. And that's the preschool. Sorry, so, nine, nine new construction homes? Nine new construction, and, and one new, child. And only one child. What year was that in? Last year, 2016-17. So, and, and if you go through this, you're going to see a lot of variability. And that's what I, and this is the raw data. 
and I've tracked it, and I've done averages. I have what's called a rate of the rate of new kids per turnover home versus new kids per new home. And basically, on average, you get one new kid per new home and a half a kid for a turnover home. And so there's a big difference. So the housing activity makes a big difference. But, you know, and this is the raw data, and this is the stuff that's really hard. And here's what, here's the distribution. Here's this plus 15 in the, uh, uh, you know, pre-K. Look at its distribution. Zero to four, four, three, two, you know. And this is the data the school doesn't have, so they don't know exactly how it's coming in into their K class till they sort of see it. But this is what's gathered, and so this is what makes it hard. Because you want to know what your kindergarten class size is. And your kindergarten class is based on the, on the kids that are born here and then the ones moving in. So, John, I just want to clarify a point. Um, the, the ratio, as you call it, or the rate. <coughs> so the classic, you know, the conventional wisdom, if you will, is retired couple sells their home. Kid, right. No kids at the present at that time. Right. And a family with kids moves in. Right. But you're saying that ratio. That's not, That is 0.5. That's 0.5 because yeah. that's because with the turnover homes and I've tracked them. Yeah. People still have kids in their home. They may move to Concord, and so that you have to track by each grade. We don't know, yeah. know exactly why. And this is the rate that could change. It hasn't changed for the past 25 years. But if baby boomers like myself stay for a long time and then we leave it when we're 80, then we're, we're not moving out with kids. So mm -hmm. that could change. Right. if people you know move in this one uh, child per new home average and half child per uh, turnover home average right are those constants or do you see any trends in those two uh, no it's it's been pretty I mean surprisingly constant over 25 years so that's and, and, and again there's a lot of variability and I haven't kind of mm -hmm. it's too small a data to do any kind of regression on because it's you know 25 data points but nonetheless I kind of looked at it and I said okay just on an average basis, this is what's happened. But, and this is the really important thing, is this turnover part is a really key issue in terms of where Carlisle is going to be in 10 years. Because we aren't going to have that many um, new houses being built. And so therefore, if you don't have new houses being built, you're counting on kids moving in to Carlisle to fill the pipeline. And that, that number, the half and the one, is that K through 12 kids or K through 8 kids? Um, K through eight. Really so I basically am just focusing here because we send a steady stream up to the. So John. Families are made in all kinds of unique ways. Correct. Right? It's not the traditional True. woman under 40. Right. You know, right. How much has, I don't even know if you have that kind of data to see how that's factored into the past 25 years versus where that's going so maybe at the state level? or cause our, average, our average family size has, of course, dropped from three to under two. In the, in state, the state, the state, okay. and so you know, and so, and it's now 1.5, 1.6, and so that becomes the whole issue from a state perspective. Are we making this friendly for families to come here, stay here, and work, and then move to a town like Carlisle? And that's a that's out of our control, but it's clearly a state issue. So that's all I all I did was just show you where I got that 15 and 18 number here, but you can see the variability over time and the trend is down the trend is down and the worry I have and all of us is how many you know if you only have 30 kids more or less being born and you're only bringing in 15 that means your kindergarten class might be 50 or below yeah. and then if you're only bringing in on average and it looks like right now it's under 20 to the K through uh, Eight. eight group, you may have a class that's only graduating at 70, which is oh, less. Less, than. Yeah. less than. So this is the house sales, and again, that's variable, but again, it's very much tied to how what's the activity of house sales of new versus old. As you can see, new is quite a lot lower. There's not as much land, 
And so that, that's a big, that's where we're vulnerable. And there's a build out, obviously. And it's a build out, so we're gonna really be depending on the turnover homes as feeding the pipeline. So, and this is, now I just go through the example. If you have 40 kids born, you bring in 20, you start with a kindergarten class of 60, then you add 20 to that, that means 80, that means your average is 70, so 70 times 9, you know, you're, you're 630, right? You do it at 30, you add 20, and I mean, you know, sort of optimistic there, for the next 5, 10 years, you end up with a kindergarten class of 50, add 15, that means 522. So that's just on averages, and obviously it can vary significantly, but I just wanted to show you the range. Here's the cohorts. So here we were in 2005, start with the kindergarten class of 79, graduated in 97, we added 20. Here's one, 56, 2009, you only added 13. And then here's the, you know, uh, 2012, and you, you know, it looks like you may be adding 20. So, and I, and you guys have to wrestle with the cohorts all the time and figure out who the teachers are and everything else. Mm -hmm. This is not easy at all. Right. And then the worry is, if we've got an unstable population over the next 10 years, how do you plan? And that's, I know, that's very much what you're debating is how you have flexible teachers and all that sort of thing. So. That's, and if we don't have new homes and we're relying on the turnovers, then we're really saying, if the, and this gets to the aging in place, we've got the aging baby boomers staying here. No place. You know. Well, what services do they need? Yeah, what services they need and, and when will they leave and new right. younger families? Right. I mean, there's a much longer term wave that says, right. okay, it doesn't happen at age 60, it happens at age 80. Right. But you're that cohort of baby boomers will right. eventually decide. Right, and this is too small a data sample to really do any kind of sophisticated statistical analysis on. You can kind of go through this and look at it and massage it, but if you, I mean, from a management of the school perspective, you get down around the 500s, that's really different than if you're running a school of 650. Yeah. To the small end problem, Right. Um, have you looked and seen that there are any other similar towns that are comparable around the country that you could form into a larger uh, data set for analysis? No, I haven't. But as you know, Bedford is growing. Houses are cheaper there. Chelmsford is growing. Acton has grown. So These aren't similar towns. No, they are. But they're, they're budding towns with, I mean, and this gets to the tax rate issue, which is basically people look at their taxes now because of where taxes are, where uh, above Concord, we're a little bit below uh, like, uh, Lincoln, and so Weston's higher than us. So, but we're a relatively high tax town because of the school building. And yes, you can get more value for your your, right. your dollars coming here, but nonetheless, it's people look at taxes. Um, so, so anyway, that's really a, you know the sort of main point and sort of and and. You know, I do this just for fun and sort of updated, mm -hmm. but it's only just looking at the raw data. I think there's a plenty of things to be, have us get concerned. How do we get in? How do we attract more families that come to town over the next 10 years? Or, or how do we set up our district to account for what is likely coming? I mean, there's to look at a different problem, most acknowledge global warming. You can say, what can we do about it you know, to, to address it, or what can we do to, to, to manage it? Right. To, to live with it. Right. Right. And we have to look at both sides. Right. right. So that's 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 really that's it. I mean, you know, the tax stuff. Helpful. We all know the taxes, but uh, yeah, good. So hopefully that makes some sense. No, it's great. Um, I think it's good. Really good information as these guys wrestle with, you know, for yeah, right. It's, yeah. That's why these guys were for the higher. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. John, yeah. you you um have been tracking this data for years now, right? Right, and since you, 1996, yeah. And you update it annually, is that how Verna you collects it from the town offices and then she sends it to me and I have a little file of demographics and so yes, I've been doing it off and on, yes. Uh, That's great, so um, next time when you update, will you send oh, us Oh, of course, that? yeah, no, absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. Uh
Um, next up is uh, Spalding Field discussion. I think we don't have any material, right? It's just an update on right. the, the study. Jim, Jim might have something to say. Okay. We are, uh, we have a vote at the end, right? About, there's a town warrant article. I guess maybe that's the question. Is that in the packet? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. the yeah. It's Article 30, right? It's in... It's the uh, study is Article 30. Right. So all we're talking about is if they authorize the study, who would manage the study? Is that the, the issue in front of us? Right. Right. If they're going to give the management... Right. Yeah, so I think Red Tom was looking for support of the article, and as we discussed in the last right. meeting, he's looking for us to allow them okay. to manage the right. study. So we'll take a vote at the end. Um, I got a panicky text from Drew McMorrow about 6.30 saying, was I supposed to come to the meeting? And I told him it's okay. We're just <laughs> announcing that, uh, that we would let RECCOM manage the study, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so let's go to the co-teaching update. Dr. Seidel. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> All the way over there? So thank you for um, inviting us to give you an update. So this year, um, co-teaching is not new to Carlisle. It comes in many different models, and we've had academic co-teaching in pockets in the middle school. Um, but this is the first time that we had two teachers every day working in a classroom. And so we had four teachers. We had, in third grade, we had Megan and Bethany. Um, in third grade and fourth grade, we had Emily and <coughs> Laura. Um, so for time's sake, I'm introducing and then Laura's going to come up as the special ed um, rep from um, fourth grade and then Megan Cox is the general ed teacher from third grade. Um, so the ultimate goal for co-teaching is really having a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher working together to deliver core instruction as well as specialized instruction as needed to a diverse group of students in one space. Um, co-teaching partnerships are where the two teachers have joint instructional decisions, they share responsibility and accountability for learning. And so this is one of the strengths of Carlisle across our grades is the strong marriage between general ed and special ed. And this just kind of takes us one step further where two teachers are working all the time, where in other grade levels in classrooms, a special ed teacher will come in or out depending on the needs of kids and then they move somewhere else. So we have this going through the whole school as far as that relationship of um, team between special ed and general ed. The co-taught model just kind of puts that kind of on steroids because they're always together. Um, co-teaching is well researched and considered by many as one of the best models. I'm sorry, I didn't even show you what I'm, there you go. Um, of the inclusive classrooms. So there are many benefits for students to the co-taught, enrichment opportunities, the increase of tiered levels of instruction in the classroom, um, the instructional uh, strategy supported by two highly qualified instructors. It's a supportive system for educators that addresses students' needs, time for students to generalize skills, opportunities for peer interactions, reduced stigma for students with disabilities, exposure to positive academic and social models. So a lot of these are happening in every classroom in Carlisle, but when you have two teachers focused together, it just allows for things to take place that one teacher cannot do by themselves. So we have tiered instruction in many classrooms, but here we have it happening throughout the day and in all subjects. Um, and so that just has allowed the, the classrooms to be able to do a lot of small group instruction to let kids stay in the classroom. So um, the teachers are gonna talk about in past years they might have been pulled out, but in the co-taught we kept kids in the classroom as much as possible. So the peer relations are very strong, the social piece is very strong, but we're still meeting their academic needs. Um, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura, who's gonna come from fourth grade. Hi, my name is Laura Marshall. I'm the fourth grade special educator. I apologize for this. I'm nervous. I've never done this before, so I'll just put that out there. Um, I have to be honest. Um, I was asked to do this job, and I have to say, hands down, it's been one of my best jobs ever. Um, doing co-taught has been phenomenal. Um, one of the benefits I really like about it is, is the small group instruction. 
So the way the classroom works is that Emily, I work with Emily King, and she'll have a class, you know, a group of kids, children over here, and I'll be over here with another small group. And what I like about it is that each time I only have four or five students in front of me, and so as a result, I get direct, I get direct um, feedback from them in terms of the instruction, how I'm delivering it, whether or not they're confused. I can instantly reevaluate how I'm teaching, as well as the small instruction encourages all children to talk with each other. So that if in the classroom, some students may be shy and may not want to talk with each other, but in the small group, they have to, they're accountable. And so as a result, I like that. And as I said, I like that you do that. Um, they're also um, part of the classroom, as opposed to when you pull a student out, you have that transition, walking down the hall, going into the class, you know, into this different environment, um, the learning center. They get set up, and you lose your time, you've got to go back. And so again, that transitional piece, I like, it's not mentioned in the slide, but I like that piece of just being in the classroom. So again, you can just work with the students and not have to pull them out and pull them in. Um, so anyhow, sorry. sorry. Um, and I like it for not losing, um, again, not having to pull the child out because sometimes students feel, oh, I'm getting pulled out, I might miss something, I'd rather stay in the classroom. And so again, that piece is just everyone's, you know, viewed the same, there's no um, stigma attached. Um, again, students are connected with their peers because they're in interacting with each other every time the small group at the table, and they're not getting pulled out. So, um, um, again, as I said, most of the services are delivered in the classroom. Um, there are some delivery um, in a, the learning center, depending upon um, what we feel is appropriate for the child. Uh, sometimes we'll pull them out, sometimes we won't. But again, the main goal is to keep them in the classroom so that they can um, just be part of the group, part of the classroom. Um, again, and the other benefit of it is, is that there, it's also for science as well as social studies, so they'll get a you know, double dose maybe of, of reading or writing when we do the science readers, because that's a lot of intense, it's a lot of vocabulary for some of our students, and so it's important if, if I'm in the classroom with them, they get the support that they need with that. Um, for some students uh, on the delivery grid, they only are, you know, supposedly going to get 30, three times 30 minutes a week for writing. But the way we structure our writing sections, we have writing basically four times a day. And we will run it two times from 9 to 9.45, 11.15 to 12. I'm in the corner with another group or, you know, the other part of the classroom. And so if students want to get the opportunity to write twice a day, they can. But as a result, oh, some of the students have just grown as writers. And so it's been, they can ha access that if they have a menu. So I apologize for not clearing that. Um, and again, students get to work with everybody. There's a lot of, um, they can work with, you know, similar peers, you know, or different peers, depending upon what their skill set is. And so again, it's, it's, just been a, it's just been a tremendous opportunity for some of these children. Um, the success stories, the, my, um, one of them is last year, um, there was a student who was pulled out four hours a day approximately and had a one-to-one. -one. And I look at this student and I, I'm like, wow, I can't believe anybody would want to be pulled out for that long because I just think socially, um, it, it just must be hard. But I, I look at how this child has, has just grown into our classroom, students exposed to the routines of the classroom, the, um, the student has to participate in, you know, the specials, and the student has been just, it just, there's so much learning than just the academic and the core that happens in the classroom that it's super important that, that children participate in all aspects of the classroom, I feel. Uh, writing, there's a, a couple of reluctant writers at the beginning of the year, and um, again, I think that, you know, because we've offered writing so many times as an opportunity for these children, and again, being able to give the immediate feedback, I think that the students have enjoyed it. And I, again, I look at some of the writing in terms of how they've used the graphic organizer, how they, you know, they've learned about the transitional words, and just all of the skills that they've learned and how they apply. And at conferences, we were talking about whether or not it might be just genre specific. Is it because the student liked talking about personal narrative? And I don't know, some of the students are still going, even though we're, doing, we're transitioning to a different genre. Hmm. So it's just been interesting. And then math, um, another student, they had um, a three-year eval, and, um, and now we're ending, and the student has met some of his goals. And so it's, again, it's just very, it's very, very, it's been very fun, for lack of better, you know, words, but it's just been a, <laughs> you talk about it, I'm serious. Um, so anyhow, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
talked about the successes and the ways in which this benefited students. Yeah. Um, what are the problems? What are the what are the cons to this? Can we do that at the end? Because we'll. Uh, I'll be happy to right? talk. Uh, well, I'll everyone come back up and then we'll. Uh, I'll be happy back. to answer that, Bill. But I would say there's very few. <laughs> Megan Cox, I'm a third grade um, general educator. Um, my wonderful co partner is uh, actually co holding my child right now. So <laughs> I feel like there's no end to the, the partnership. Um, <laughs> um, this year has been an incredible opportunity, not only to see the children's growth, but also I think it's pushed myself as an educator and having the opportunity to work with a special educator in the classroom has taught me a lot and has really refocused and re-energized the way that I think about teaching. Um, I think one of the best things about the co-teaching model is the increased time that is given to students who not only struggle but also need to be challenged. We have all this, all these people in the room and all these resources where we can take these kids who maybe in the past could have gotten bored you see increase in behaviors, and we're giving them what they need. Um, this past around conferences, one of my students is, he's kind of gone through very easily, like he hasn't been challenged very much because a lot hasn't come, hasn't been hard for him. And so his dad said, oh yeah, I know, he was talking about science, and I'm like, oh yeah, I told him that um, the longest word in the world is pneumon ultra microscopic circles of pentaconiosis, and he goes, you just gained a lot of points with him. That I did. Yeah. So, um, to speak behavior, they don't have time to be bored. There's eyes on them at all times. That was one of their complaints. Yeah. We said, well, what is one of the downfalls? They said, there's always someone looking at me. Yeah. Like, we know, that's what we're here for. Um, because we're allowed, we're able to have more heterogeneous grouping, students who have always struggled are now able to bolster the students who haven't, so that they're able to provide strategies that they've always had to use that these kids may not have. Um, the transfer of the skills is immediate. We have the generalization happening in the classroom, which has compounded the results that you'll see in the next slide. Um, there's a lot of different approaches. Um, Bethany and I could not be more opposite in so many ways. <laughs> uh, if, I'll, if I say I, I oh, I'll absolutely never have it, she's like, it's my favorite. I'm like, exactly, like, that's why it works. It's really, it's, it's a nice marriage of two different approaches, and I think they really appreciate that. They're able to see different ways of attacking a problem and then using it if it works for them. So what uh, we did was we compiled data from the IEPs from the previous year and compared it with this year. Um, if you look at all the students who were receiving their services last year in the classroom, there were zero minutes of in-class tier three, which is the special education. Compared to this year, where you can see the change increase because the services were happening within the classroom environment. Um, if you look at, in the end, the increased time spent in the classroom from last year to this year, there's an average increase of above 300 minutes for our group of students who came into us. So looking at that, there's one student in general who I thought really simplified the, the growth that we have been seeing. So in the past year, the student was receiving the services as pullout and was struggling to have the transfer into the in-class work. So the student increased their time in the classroom by 330 minutes a week. If you look at the MAC performance data, and you look at the pre and the, pro, the post scores, the percent of change I think speaks for itself. Yeah. You have 218% change just with the first unit of math. The unit four test, 810%. That's happening within the classroom, still receiving the services that are on the student's academic IEP. Um, they came in reading at a level K, which to give you an idea is the beginning of second grade. I had to stop assessing this student because they hit the benchmark, they hit the ceiling where we couldn't assess them any further. Um, and they're reading above grade level right now. I imagine that makes a child very happy and confident. So they sit up much higher when you go to that. That's really, that's awesome. They say, I have to keep going, you're doing too well. And they're like, oh really? <laughs> and then they look around and they see, and something I really love that Bethany does is she'll show them the book that they started on, and then where they are now. And 
that stuck with me so much. To look at these kids, look where they came from, and to see the growth they made is why we do what we do. It's just been really incredible. It looks like you discovered water. It's, it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like, as, like we see it like every day. Like we walk away and I really can say, I've been teaching third grade for eight years now. This year, I really feel like we're able to give them what they need, which is really incredible. So we asked the students for their feedback. Why not go right to the source? And then we said, um, if you think about our classroom, having two teachers, what activities do you do when now that you couldn't do when there was one? And something that just really stood out to me was, I didn't have to leave the room when somebody else was teaching something. I didn't have to miss something. Yeah. That speaks volumes. They feel like a genuine member of our classroom community. And that input, that buying, that feeling of involvement is what pushes everything else. Um, some of the more, with one teacher, there can only be one group. With more teachers, there can be more, absolutely. But that then also speaks to less time to be disengaged, less time for behaviors, and like they said, more eyes on them. Um, how does this class compare? None of them said it was worse. I'll take that. Um, about the same six. 12 of them said it was better, and two decided not to respond. Um, what stood out to me was the comfort. I feel more comfortable in this classroom. And just to say, this data is compiled from students on academic IEPs, but also not on academic IEPs. <clears throat> They're happier. They're learning double. It's helpful to have more teachers, because we learn things in different ways. We're meeting them with what they need, not with just what we know. And then, went to the families. Again, the feedback is not just from students who are receiving academic IV support. This is all the classroom community. An incredible blessing. It's really cool in the beginning. I thought it was interesting. Um, they said they, their students thrived in a smaller group setting. That's the foundation of co teaching. Um, it's worked really well. It's exceeded expectations. Uh, once one parent had another student in a different class, and they, <laughs> with their wording, I just love language, an embarrassment of riches to know that one student was receiving a different experience. Um, and just the commitment to the co teaching model. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, I know, Bethany, can you come up too with Laura? Just sure. Uh, free. Um, so, one of the things that we just sent out, I sent out a parent survey to both classes just on Monday. So, we're gathering that data. Um, and so far, we have 19 families that have, or parents that have responded, and 18 out of 19 said that they would like their child to have another COPE um, taught experience. So, we asked a lot, and we'll put that data together. We're also um, not only having data from the classroom, but looking at data across the grade level, so we can compare, because we have high, middle, and low in every classroom, but we have a larger concentration of more complexity in this classroom, so we just want to see how that does with the other um, classrooms as well. So now we'll take questions. Josh. A couple questions. Uh, first, it's wonderful the results that you're getting. In the it seems like a great success. In any program, it brings pros and cons. We've talked about the pros. Can you tell us, tell us a little bit, please, about the cons? What, whether you anticipated them or not, were the downsides of this approach? John, I'll, I'll time. <laughs> I think, um, I can't even tell you the amount of time uh, Emily and I um, are constantly planning together. And so I would say that that has been um, the, it's been the hardest part of this. What is the implication of that? Is that there's less time with students? Is that there's no, more dollars spent? Time, no. There's more dollars spent in, in, in no, salaries? No, no, no. Hired? The, the, no it's, it, it's, 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 like? um, that's my personal time. You know, so I don't. You know, I don't even know if it's a personal time. But at night, I'll go home and I'll plan what we're going to talk about, what we're going to teach, or how we're going to present, or or just you know. Um, so I just say it takes it's a lot more time intensive because you're uh, con we are constantly trying to figure out how we're going to teach the students, what we're going to teach, and what the materials are going to be taught. So I'd just say, and I don't, I don't, 
I don't know, I'd say that's the, the hardest, at least for me, and I'd say for Emily, I think that's the toughest time in terms of. And I'm just going to throw it, I think in one class, we didn't anticipate some of the um, social behaviors between each other, where some we did, but some we did not. Um, so that, and that might be true in any classroom that might happen, but because the room is already complex, that added more to that room. I think like any, like we speak to co-teaching often as a marriage. So there's the growing pains, the getting, when you first move in together, you realize it's not what it seems like when you have your own space. And so I think the beginning was just kind of figuring each other out, seeing how we worked, what did, what was really important for us, how could we balance the needs of what we came into this with. And then ultimately what came about is what did we need to do that was best for the students? And I think that the initial, like the bumps and just figuring that out was a little bit difficult to navigate, but it never impacted the students. It was just us trying to figure out what was best for us and setting up the like little things like, where does this need to go? How can I not cross paths with you when we're changing into different areas? Um, but again, that was the very beginning. And any, when we went to a lot of the trainings and visited other schools, they said it's more of the long-term projection so the first year, you're just trying to figure out how is this going to work? What does it look like? Because we didn't know what it looked like coming into them. Right. So um, once that, that was kind of like the most difficult part. But since then, it's really, it's taken off. We know each other. We It becomes more of like a dance. We know how things are going to work. We are taking in each other's um, behaviors and ideas and um, thinking. And so it's, it just become more seamless. So, so building on that question, um, it sounds like the extra time you're talking about, Laura, is two components, right? There's the getting to know each other as a teammate and developing really a new curriculum for the grade, right? And, and then there's the individual, as Dennis mentioned, as you would have any new year, you have to tailor it to the student you, students you have. But it would seem then that that would encourage keeping those pairings or any pairings we develop, keeping them together. Right? Assuming they're successful. What? Yeah. Well, it sounds like it. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you measure how this, the impact of this model in the, as the kids progress to the next grade? So, well, one thing you would be looking at is growth every year. So we always look at personal growth from students to students. So in the fourth grade, we've already been talking to the fifth grade and Jen Prey as well of how we'll transition these kids into the fifth grade. Um, and um, that's what we're doing in now, second grade to third grade, third grade to fourth grade. We do it every year. We look at the cohort and we are looking at the personal growth of students um, as they move from grade to grade. I had two questions, I think. I did, yeah. one of them. Um, stepping back from it and looking at this and calling it a successful uh, pilot or, or idea, what was the process that was followed to come up with and institute that idea? And what else can be fed into that process or can be created from that process? So I have quite a history with code teaching, both as a teacher and as a principal. Um, and Will also, sorry, Mr. Berberts, the specialized director, also had um, background as well as some teachers. So what we were looking at is finding cohorts that um, avail themselves at a grade level. We also communicated with parents um, that th we were looking to do this and that parents could communicate with us before we kind of went in. Then once they found out their child was in, we had opportunity for them to come in and talk to me, talk to the teachers as we looked forward. So it was a practice that is well researched. So we looked at the research telling us what are different things and models that we could use. Um, and so the reason third and fourth grade were picked, because I think we have many teachers that would be interested and they again love that connection between special ed and general ed. Um, but these two cohorts really worked well for us to try this for the first time. So to, to parrot back what I'm hearing in slightly different words, what you're saying is uh, the, the leaders in administration had experience with the model mm -hmm. in other environments. It was supported by academic research. Mm -hmm. And um, you went through a process then to roll it out with parents, with educators, and so on. Yes. So building out on that, I mean, the natural question is how do you scale it? Because this was a pilot? Yes. Right. This was okay. our so first you picked year. two years, and 
now the third graders, I presume, the rising fourth graders are going to get the benefit of a year of it at third grade mm -hmm. and now repeat, having another year, right? So, right. so it would be like a loop. There would be certain kids that we would keep within the cohort and bring in new kids mm -hmm. into fourth grade. So, so that brings up, class. right, so I get a lot of questions. Well, I mean, one is the scalability. So it's, yep. I can see it scaling to all the K through four grades because you can, I presume, decide based on the demographics coming in, of, especially of the kids who have uh, need for the special ed part, you can create that grouping in a way that makes sense. Right? To a certain degree, there are some classes that we wouldn't be able to do it in one class. We might do academic quota right. in more than one classroom. And, and there is a downside, I guess, if, if you're using a SPED resource in a co-teaching environment, the ones who are not in that classroom or if it, I mean, you have to address the needs of those children. Right. right. So typically though, be, in the other classrooms, you still have high, middle, and low uh, performers, right. but you have a teacher who, you know, there are some teachers who there's one or two kids that you like need to go to right. after you introduce. Well, that isn't true. Right. Sometimes in the other classroom, so they can spread their time out more evenly versus okay. focusing on one or two kids right. because we now have them more grouped with two adults. Yeah. So that does allow even the classroom that it doesn't have the co taught right. to actually have more face time with and more is students. That in fact, if, if we had the other teachers of your grade level here, they would agree with that. I think some would agree with that. That's one thing we're looking at is how much time they're having with their kids and what results have we had in those okay. classrooms. And then the other following question for me is, so now you go to five, right? You mentioned Jen Praise getting, you know, your fourth graders coming out. Mm -hmm. and how, how does that gonna fit and, and is there any applicability? I know the high school, the middle school has a, it seems to me as a middle school parent, a somewhat modified version of co-teaching already in that the kids are in study skills and the you know Jessica or whoever sort of shadows through the through the uh, special you know through the specific grade subject. So, is that kind of the hybrid of that, or do you have some applicability of true co-teaching into? I realize you're not a middle school guy, right? But no, I do know that there are certain pairs that are co-teaching presently in the middle school, yeah. right? So then the question is, with a cohort moving forward, then again. Like we asked the question, how do we meet the needs of the kids going forward? And so even though it might not be in the same model we have now, some kids have really been able to make big jumps, which is going to help them when they go into another setting for to so look at that support. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Mr. Gambino, hey. right on time. Perfect. I have a, my AD specialist. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Gambino, have your children eaten? Did you feed the kids? We just got home from softball. Sorry. They're, they're in the car. They're in the car. They're actually in the car. You know the name of it, that's pretty good. Sure. Thank you. Which might be okay. Okay, we'll not venture too far from this because it doesn't seem super stable. <laughs> okay, so I am here tonight to talk about proposed zoning bylaw amendments for the recreational marijuana establishments. Um, <coughs> These are a series of uh, warrant articles in town meeting. Can you identify yourself first? Yes. <laughs> well, you don't know. Wow. You know, you were waiting to do that, weren't you? I, yes, I, I now am. officially passed the baton. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Pete Gambino. I'm chair of the planning board. Um, and I'm married to somebody here in the school committee. It's, it's giving me a hard time as usual. So. Um, and I was asked to come here tonight because we're going around to all the boards to try to build consensus and gain support for the Warren Articles and the ballot questions that we'll be proposing um, to the town over the next month or so. Um, 
These are to do with recreational marijuana establish establishments, so they're all about zoning. They're nothing to do about recre recreational use of marijuana or things like that. It's really just about the zoning of commercial establishments for marijuana. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're asking the town to do two different things. We're asking the town to vote for one or both of the zoning bylaw amendments that are going to be at town meeting. These will require two-thirds majority of town meeting to pass. And we're also going to ask the town to vote on one or both of the ballot questions in town election on May 7th. What are we asking now specifically? The recreational marijuana, marijuana laws in Mass, they allow possession of use, distri distribution, cultivation of marijuana in limited amounts by persons of age 21 or older. They provide for the regulation of commerce in marijuana, marijuana accessories, marijuana products, and for the taxation of proceeds from sales of these items. Okay? Our proposed bylaws would not apply to personal consumption. They would not apply to personal use of, of, any, way, of any way, shape, or form. They only pertain to the establishment and zoning of facilities related to recreational marijuana here in the town of Carlisle. And it's very important to call out, too, that these have no bearing on medical marijuana in town and medical marijuana facilities. The town already has established bylaws for these. We are not looking to change the substance of those. There's a few wording things that of corrections of stuff. But there's, there's nothing that we're looking in that bylaw to change when we're addressing the recreational facilities. Okay, the Cannabis Commission of Massachusetts is defining eight distinct marijuana establishment types. These are what are regulated in the state. There's retailers, someone off the street can walk in, buy marijuana. There's marijuana cultivators, okay? This is really the, the farming or the agricultural component, but it is not deemed farming or agricultural in our state. In our state. It is still a marijuana cultivator. Um, there's been a lot of question about this. Uh, we're a very agricultural sensitive, or uh, open to agriculture in, this town, agriculture in this town. This isn't like your typical growing of, of crops. This is usually container-based, it's indoors. It's not, you know, it's not the on expansive fields across the town of Carlisle. Um, there's craft cooperatives. That's basically a small business model for everything except retailers on this list. So as a craft, craft cooperative, you could be a cultivator, you could be a product manufacturer, transporter, but it's limited in the square footage of the size of the facility compared to, compared to the other ones which are not limited in the same fashion. Um, you have transporters, research facilities, laboratories, and micro businesses. Okay. So where are we right now in the whole timeline of, of what needs to be done and what's been done in Carlisle? Right now, um, Carlisle had passed a temporary moratorium um, that expired 12-31-2018. We attempted to renew it in town meeting that voted, that passed close to unanimously. I think there was only a couple of dissent, dissension of the votes. Um, however, what ended up happening is the because the Cannabis Control Commission got to the point where these laws were finalized, the Attorney General stopped renewing the temporary bans. So we kind of got stuck in the middle there. So we need to pass something in this town meeting, um, and if it doesn't pass, we need to pass something in a subsequent town meeting soon to get, to get something on the books for zoning bylaws. Um, if no local restrictions are adopted in the town, then the state law will allow for one of each of the eight types of establishments, these here, so the state law basically dictates that um, you can have one of each type of facility for 20% of the package stores that you have in town. Where they came up with that, I have no clue of that calculation, but we have one package store in town, which is Ferns, so we're allowed one of each type by state law. Um, can you speak to the bottom bullet, host community agreement? Yes. Is that a gate on the, uh, the establishments? Is it a what? Is it a gate on the establishments? Is that not a gate, but it is. It is a document that's going, or it, it is an agreement with the town that is going to control and be able to regulate the use of those facilities in town. So what that is, a host community agreement would be a um, basically a contract negotiated with the board of selectmen. It starts at the state. Um, if somebody wanted to apply for a recreational marijuana facility in the town of Carlisle, they start at the state level with their application. Once they got through that, it'd be passed off to the town. The Board of Selectmen had the opportunity um, to negotiate a host community agreement. Those host community agreements um, usually have to do a lot with the, um, 
the dependency on, on that establishment on the town. You know, police details, um, uh, access to, uh, you know, site plan review would also be applicable to this later on. But it ends up being a negotiated agreement between the, the business and the town regarding the, the business, regarding the establishment of that business in our town. So we'd have opportunity to set conditions on any business anyway. Correct. Even they are limited to what we can do in state law. And it's, I kind of equate that to a site plan review where it is not our ability to turn it away and turn it down, but it is our ability to set conditions on, on that establishment of business in town. Um, now, there, there is a lot of precedents out there that you can't, you, you have to allow for these, so you can't block these. So if it's in the state law, and we don't have a zoning bylaw that says something different, and they come in and they want to establish it anywhere, we legally can't say no you know, to them. We can't be like, no, you can't do it there, because we don't have a zoning bylaw that says something different than what the state, the state laws say. So that host community agreement will allow us to set additional conditions on there, but I don't think it's going to be, give us the ability to, um, to regulate placement. I don't think it's going to give us the ability to regulate um, the size of the business and things like that. It just basically gives us the ability to regulate our interaction with that business as a town. Does state law place any restrictions on placement? No. Not with respect to the school? Well, OK, yes. Yeah, let me go there. I'm, going, so I'm answering that from that zoning cap on. There's, there are minimum, minimum setbacks from child uh, daycare, school facilities. Um, uh, those are the major ones. But basically, any place with children, just like a lot of like cell, cell towers and stuff, it's like a thousand. Don't quote me in the number, but there's a something foot setback sure. that these facilities all have to adhere to from that. So that, that's very typical in the zoning bylaws that we see from the state. Um, so yes, there are there are restrictions like the Highline Building would not be a good site. Let's put it that way you know, for it. So. <laughs> no, we won't be very for that building, but there goes Josh's <laughs> retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there are there are some limited things, but let's say you know you're not within the school district, the school zone, things like that. Then we, the town, without a zoning bylaw, would not have the ability to regulate where a site goes and where it doesn't go. Okay, so I kind of covered the steps. We've sought two temporary moratoriums. The AG didn't never ratify the second one. Um, after that, we've conducted two public meetings to try to gather information and try to get the town the town's consensus on what direction we want to head with this. We didn't want it as a planning board to try to infer that us seven people knew everything about what the town wanted. So we had a, we had a couple public meetings and we did a town-wide survey. Um, and we result, we've also worked pretty extensively with town council to figure out what other towns were doing and to draft these bylaws in, in accordance to, to things that we've seen with other towns around us. Um, what we're going to be at, the, the, what we did is we asked in a survey, um, trying to get consensus from the town about what direction they wanted to head. We asked in the survey, would you like to establish a permanent townwide ban on all recreational marijuana facilities? We asked about establishing a zoning bylaw to regulate facilities instead of a, instead of a full townwide ban. And then we, um, we asked about the establishment of a zoning bylaw to regulate facilities to less than what the state man mandates. And I'm going to get into what's important about that in a few minutes. So those are kind of the, 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 the bulk of the survey. We want to know, hey, do you want to allow it at all, at all, yes or no? OK, if you do want to allow it, you just want to go to state minimums. And the third question was, OK, if you don't want to go to state minimums, what do you guys think is a good model for our town? We have 321 responses, which is pretty good. Um, 258 or 81% of them were in favor of limiting recreational marijuana, marijuana facilities in some form. Okay, that means below the state levels, that means something that really conforms to more about what Carlisle is. 58% were in favor of a complete ban. And that's basically the, the outcome of the survey. Um, we, had, we further asked about, in that survey, of those eight types, if you were in favor of limiting it, which two types were you most apt to allow in town? And of course, no surprise, the two that came back were cultivator and craft cooperative, which is a small business model include, that includes cultivation. So from this, the planning board formed two zoning bylaw amendments. Number one was to do a townwide ban in all facilities. Okay? Number two was to limit the townwide facilities to one cultivator 
in one craft, craft, the craft cooperative only and zone those in the locations that we already had set up for zoning for medical marijuana use. Um, none of these will apply to personal use of marijuana at all, so I just want to make sure we make that differentiation. This is only to do with the commercial facilities. Um, and none of, these, none of these laws that we're proposing here, again, none of them will apply to medical marijuana facilities because we already have that zoned in our town. So we started, we also did a little bit of research about what other towns are doing. Concord has a partial ban, no retail establishments. That's very similar to the partial ban that we're proposing. Bedford also has a partial ban with no retail establishments. Acton, Westford, and Chelmsford had a full ban. And Billerica has a small zoning district right on our border, by the way, along Route 3, right at the prison. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's what, it, here's what a map around this looks like, right? Carlisle and Little, we don't have anything yet. Working on that with these. Acton, Westford, Chelmsford. If you look at Billerica, it's all red because they zoned a small district. The rest of it around them is all red. There's no, mar no recreational marijuana facilities allowed in that. And that, this right here is right along Trouble Cove Road, the green going up Route 3. So I want to go into specifically what we're asking to, do, to happen in the town ballot. We're going to have two votes on, on the uh, town meeting agenda that require two-thirds majority to pass. Zoning bylaws, unlike general bylaws, unlike most town meeting votes, require two-thirds of the people to vote in favor of the bylaw. The first bylaw is to completely ban recreational, uh, recreational marijuana facilities in the town of Carlisle. The second bylaw is to limit the establishment and placement of recreational marijuana facilities in the town of Carlisle. Okay. Now, both of these bylaws would limit the facilities to be at a level less than the state law maintains. So what do we need to do after that? We need to do a townwide ballot vote on our election vote this May that will that will back up one or both of these votes at town meeting. And that, that is because the town of Carlisle voted with a 52 to 48% margin to allow recreational marijuana use in the state of Massachusetts. So because we are above that 50% threshold, we have to conduct another town vote to get it down below, to get the vote back up against 50, up over 50% on one of these two measures. So this is confusing at best, right? Now we got two votes in, on, in town meeting, two votes on the ballot, and what do they all mean? What does it work? Um, I'm gonna just jump to the next slide because it's more clear. Very clearly how it will work. If a full ban passes in town meeting and the full ban passes in, on the ballot, a full ban is in effect. Again, that's only for facilities. And that is regardless of the partial ban vote. So the full ban will trump the partial ban. Okay, if the full ban fails at either town meeting or on the ballot, but the partial ban passes in town meeting and the partial ban passes at the ballot, then a partial ban is in effect. Okay, if one or either fails at both of them, then we have no zoning bylaw in effect and the planning board is back to the drawing board to produce a probably less restrictive bylaw. Okay. However, going to what Josh was asking about before and everything, the, the licensing restrictions and the host, the town host agreements still apply because that's part of the state law. One important note as I'm concluding, if you do support a full ban, ban please also vote for the partial ban. Okay? Because we don't want a whole bunch of people going out and saying, yeah, let's vote for the full ban and it fails by a couple votes and then they don't vote for the partial ban, then that would fail too. So if you vote for full, vote for partial. If you vote for partial, great. Um, so, so what you're saying is at town meeting, you can vote yes to support full ban. Yes. And then the next vote comes, and you can vote yes to do the partial ban. Is it right. the same? So it's the same at, at the ballot, right? Same you can, at the ballot. You can just say check yes and yep, yes. Yep, two, two different ballot questions. But it won't go to the ballot unless it passes at town meeting, right? Well, no. I mean, it's pretty it, it, the ballot will mean nothing if it doesn't pass the town meeting, but we can't change the ballot until we're in the 35-day window. Not in effect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a massive education. It is. Like yep, and that's why we can go into all the different boards oh, yeah, yeah. And, and education. Is this the uh, presentation that you're going to use at town meeting? This is the exact presentation I sent away, I'm sending away. So I think if, if there's anything that's confusing about it, 
It would be good yeah, to know yeah, that now. Good. I think, it, to me, it's pretty clear, and I thought, I applaud you, did a nice job yeah. of walking us through. The, um, we're being asked as a committee, we're requesting that we take a position. Mary asked me whether we ought to be taking a position on a zoning bylaw, but to my, to my thinking, if it was about Joe Blow building a swimming pool, we would not take a position. But given that it's recreational marijuana, and it could potentially be around the corner, I, I believe, we can, we'll debate it that we'll take a vote, but I believe we should take a position on it. That's just my opinion. Yeah, the, the, the setback from school is like any zoning by law, it's, in the, it's measured in feet. It's not in miles or anything like that. So it's right around the corner, could be you know, at the end of Church Street or something like that. But um, Was it considered at all what the tax benefits yes. would be? And have those been quantified? Yep. Yes, they have been. Uh, we actually did some pretty extensive research on that, because as you know, we are also starting a master planning effort. And we did not want to rule out anything that could be a potential source of income for the town. Tax benefit is very low. It's 3% max and is only on retail sales. The town has been pretty, pretty against the retail sales piece. It's not like on the full entire you know, net worth of the company. It would only be on the sales portion. Um, and what other towns have found is that that 3% is really not covering their expenses. Now, with a host community agreement, you can negotiate on any of the other ones up to 3% of the total value of the company, right? Um, no, total value of revenue, sorry. Not just sales, revenue, that was the difference um, of the company. Now, but that three percentage has to be 100% backed up by direct expenses incurred by the town with a host community agreement. Like so we what? Could, uh, what kind of expenses did the town incur in this scenario? Police details. So that, yep. so when the line forms, that kind of stuff, yeah, we're exactly. hearing in other communities? Okay. Yeah, there, there's been some other communities that have had very um, active, retail establishments yeah. and they're having a tough time in traffic, having a tough time with the police details. Um, the, I'm not gonna try to be like a doomsday sayer, but the crime, they were saying that the crime goes up and the policing of these facilities go up. Go up. So whether it's real crime or perceived, there's always gotta be a police presence around. And so that, that's really the direct expense that's really been hitting these towns is, is the mitigation and the control of the crowds and the, and the, uh, the policing of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For your, You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Nancy, we didn't have, a, we have a vote on solar, but not a discussion. But I see Jonathan is here. And I wonder, do you want to have a discussion of where we are with solar? Because that's a, a, also another by the way, complicated by the way. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So Jonathan, would you like to come up? Sure. Okay, so. Uh, you want to, uh, Melinda, walk us through the, What's going on here? Okay, so there are going to be three uh, warrants on a town meeting. The yep. first is the zoning bylaw amendment. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about that last time. Yep. Basically, um, it yep. is an amendment to add the school mm -hmm. to the solar overlay district. Mm -hmm. um, so the school parcels are added. There is an exclusion, which is um, 800 feet from School Street. That is mm -hmm. meant to exclude Spalding Field and Spalding Hill. Yep. Um, the second warrant article is to approve um, allowing the school committee to enter into a lease agreement with Amoresco. Um, and the, the power purchase agreement is with the, is with the town, it's all part of the same yeah. lease, okay? Um, and the third one is for the uh, school parking lot paving. So. Yep, and it looks like we're, we need a two thirds vote on the first one because it's a zoning bylaw. Yep. Uh, we need a majority vote on the second one. Yep. And they're planning on putting uh, the paving in debt, I believe, yep. which means we're going to need a two thirds vote on the third one as well. Okay. So I think we're looking right now just for the school committee to you know, support. Yeah, to, to take a supporting thing. We don't want to restrict you guys to be able to you know, control right. the least details later or anything. So it's just supporting more. So, so, yeah, go ahead. so it's important to, to note we're going to move these articles in that order. Right, the zoning bylaw first. Yeah. Um, if that passes, that's great. We need two thirds. If it doesn't pass, then. Then the, we don't move the other two, the obviously. But um, then we move the on the lease, and, and tonight we should take a position um, regarding yeah. that as well. It's not right. the lease hasn't been finalized; it's still right. in the draft form. But this would just be right. you know, yeah. indicating support to enter into the lease agreement. Yeah. Um, if that that requires a fifty a majority, so if that doesn't pass, then that, you know it didn't move the paving. Right. That's the, the sequence. Um, the 
thing that we should probably discuss is regarding the, the paving. Um, I've been to the FinCom and was likely meeting. They've yeah. been hesitant to take positions um, at the last couple of meetings on the warrant articles that have a financial impact. Yeah. But, they're, but they do eventually do that. And they do eventually do that, yeah. I, um, I pressed them last night to take a position on the paving. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this, how right. important it is. Um, right. the, the school committee is entering into a, a lease agreement to lease, you know. Yeah and revenue is going to be generated, it's going to cause further um, you know, deterioration to the lot, which is already over 30 years old. Right. Um, it needs to be paved two years ago. Right. Uh, it, you know, we're also thinking that, and we're also going to find out um, what the additional expense would be to pave it at a future time with the canopies in place. Yeah. That's going to make it logistically more difficult for the pavers to do it. It'll probably be more expensive. Are they, are they quoting that too? The paving company. We're going to find out how much that is. Yeah, we're looking into getting that information. It's a little bit difficult right now because uh, we're already sending out public bids for it. So. But we have a public. We have a public bid for the regular, the pre. Uh, we have a quote. We don't. Our, we have a quote. Mm -hmm. There, uh, Tim Goddard is working on the process of sending out the public bid. You get the information back for that before town meeting, but he has to kind of be a little careful as to what he asks for now that the public bid is out there. Right. Can't really amend it. But, so, um, but he's, he's, he's going to figure he's out how to get it. He's going to ask our, our paving where we got the yeah. quote from and what kind of um, additional expense that would amount to if they had to worry about going around. So the, the issue for us to, to think about is, you know, Obviously, we'd like to have support for all of, all three of these from all the town boards, right? I'm at a town meeting, you know, what happens if the first two are voted and then the last, the, the third one? There's no paving. Well, I mean, I'm I'm actually, you know, if they're going to be stupid. They're going to be stupid. I, I can't. I don't think we can control that. I'm more. Go ahead. Yeah. There's another element too. As I understand, the third one, it's does the town approve a debt exclusion? Meaning that we can borrow and not have that included in our. It is not a debt exclusion. It's not a debt exclusion. Yeah. It's just to it's just to just, borrow the money. Just to borrow the money. Okay. So, so we can still spend the money. The we just can't payments, borrow the money. The, the Wait, no, payments we, are going to offset the cost. It's not a debt that's going to be used to pay down the debt, right? So right. we're generating revenue by entering into a lease agreement. Right. We need to be responsible to take care of you know our municipal assets. This yeah. imagine you know we saw the solar canopies right. and the thing is crumbling apart right. under people's feet and what kind of feeling is not going to be about well, Right, so I have two you know, points that I want to raise tonight. One is, I told you, David Newman uh, you know, was the manager of the Comcast installation, and he showed me pictures, and they destroy whatever you've got under there if you don't. I mean, installing the panels? Installing the, well, installing the posts. The, yeah. So if you don't pave and install posts co-incident, they, they will make the parking lot unusable if we don't pay, they'll just make it unusable through their construction process, period. And so that's one issue. The other issue, which is related to that, in my mind, is the timing. I mean, assuming it all passes, let's just assume it all passes, then, as I understand it, Amoresco then, only then starts the detail work, right? Because they wouldn't start it unless it was a real project. And then they have to come back and go through planning board, site review, blah, 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 everybody weighs in and then permitting, and I don't know all the things, but I assume that that makes it very difficult to do construction this summer, that you're really looking at this fall, yeah. pushing it out. So, you know, just if, if we were to fast track everything, you yeah. know, um, it looks like it would be, school would let out before they would get the permits in place, right? Well, so, that's okay that school is out. No, I know, but that's, I mean, so it's, it's like at least again, two months of permitting process right. okay. that we have to go through. Right. So, so the, and that's if we pushed it. Right, we're projecting between August, yeah. so August, and it could potentially go into... And how long is does Amoresco feel the construction process? That, how long will it will from start to finish? Uh, I don't know that we have a uh, time frame on that yet. Like, However, we did time. talk to uh, the other schools that have yeah. done work with them. And everyone came back with glowing reviews about how awesome they were to work with, even if they did it during school hours and stuff. Okay. So, so, so you're saying you think it would be okay to not be able to like, bring buses and cars? Well, we'd have to figure out the yeah, logistics do of doing that approach. during the school year. Um, but I, I don't think it would be an impossibility. Right? Well, well uh, right. We're not really sure, though, right? 
We're not sure. Okay. <laughs> we, yeah. Ideally, but based on what happened in the summer, yeah. and when we put the, you know, we're putting out the bid, um, the time frame is, in, is indicated there. So it's anticipated that there's going to be coordination. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm so yeah. the other the other piece to consider for us as a school committee and for you know the administration in terms of operations is you know how would if if it does run into September <coughs> how are we going to manage that and you know we could potentially use a phased approach where you know one portion is being done and the other one's still usable. Yeah, so I don't want to get be, into. I think it can be worked out. Is what I'm saying. Well, it, it can be. I think that to boil it down to, we don't have to decide it now, but I think. There would be a, a critical decision point to say either we have a workaround plan that will involve some inconvenience, but we'll get it done in what I think is generally the best time to pave anyway, which is the yeah. fall because it's dry and all that. Or we say, no, you know, that's all too complicated, and we push it out to summer of 20, which has a financial penalty, yeah, if you will. Right? Really yeah, is that yeah. at all viable as an option, or is that really a non starter? I think that that would that would be tough. I don't know what the financial impact of doing that would be, um, but it probably would be pretty okay. unpalatable. But, but, but David, that's a possibility. But if that's the case, and therefore they decide not to go ahead, or we decide it's too inconvenient for the school now, you got to you got to do it later. Um, we have the option of saying no later. If we say yes now. If we say no, no, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting we we don't say yes. I think we should say yes. I just we should understand that yes. I'm all in favor, of it, but we should understand that yes has a very strong likelihood of a construction project going on. Yeah, and that's that's a big challenge, right? So yes means go ahead. Right. Yes means we hope that yes means that they support the paving. Warrant, right? Well, without the yeah, paving warrant, right? Without right. The, we have more so, problems. We always have the opp opportunity as yeah, yeah, right, to right. say no later. Yes, no, I, get, I get that. Right. So the committee retains the authority. Right. And, and just to be clear, we're just looking for support of the warrant articles here. You still have the leverage of signing the lease later. I, you know, there's all absolutely. Kinds of stuff, I just want so. us to be all kind of calibrated yeah. on what we're saying. Yeah. So I, I think um, that's all. I don't want to be late. So this. Is so one other comment to what you said earlier is Amoresco is required to patch. A lot. Yeah. Um, you know, patches are not as good as regular paving, but they wouldn't leave it, you know, destroyed. I think they would have right. to. They there would, would have be to some remediation. Yeah. But it would not be as good as a freshly paved lot, right. of course. Of course. Okay. So, I think that's good. I think we're good. Thank you. Uh, uh, John. One other comment that I think we should make is based on the value of the leases and the pilots. Yeah. It looks quite likely like the lease payment from the canopies at the school mm -hmm. would be sufficient to cover the cost of the payment um, over a 20 year bond. Yeah. So we, we kind of can look at it like we can do the paving and the, the panels now and effectively get the paving for, for free, free. Right. or we can do the panels now or do nothing now and have to pay for the paving later. Right. Anyway. right. So mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. With you. So I think that's how I look at it. Good. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so one more agenda uh, topic just to cover, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but uh, it's a calendar. Um, it's a calendar question. Uh, so I'll identify a few things. One is, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the last standing meeting of this committee. Uh, but, um, and then what happens, of course, we have town meeting at the end of the month. We have a vote on May 8th, 6th, 7th. The original schedule calls for a school committee meeting the following day. Um, we're fortunate that it doesn't appear we're gonna have a contested election for a school committee, so. We kind of already know who our new members will be. We, prior, not knowing that when we put this agenda together, uh, Nancy and I were concerned that that would be too short of a time frame from election to committee to get organized with new that. members. We did it. But I think just because we always, we always did, did it, I don't think it's good practice. But I don't say too short because well, we've done it for years. I still think it's, it's too short. <laughs> I know we've done it for years. I just don't think it's a good practice. However. In this situation where we already know the members, I'm less concerned. So the question is, do we want to move the meeting from May 8th to May 15th, or do we just want to leave it? And I, I mean, at this point, I'm There's fine with either one. Yeah. Oh. 
it, it does affect right us because we'll, we'll, we'll be coming to present superintendent evaluations. Right. And also, well, that's a okay. separate that, question. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, that's different. And yeah. Also, as a matter of policy, we still are on the committee and we set it scheduled, whether we're at the meeting or not. Well, you set the schedule now. You that, are that's, setting that's, the that's my point. Okay, so, so let's, says, right. So we're, let's we're say, okay. we do have a say. So let's, yeah, okay, so, all right, good. Now let's talk about the yeah. May meeting and the June meeting. So there's two important things. There's the student presentations and their superintendent eval. Mm -hmm. But there's no magic that they both have to coincide in the June meeting, right, for example. Uh, or there's no magic that the student presentations have to be everybody in one meeting. We could have grade school presentations and middle school presentations, or arts and language. I mean, it, we can divide it any way we want. So, so the question for you know a brief debate here is, discussion I should say, is how we want to structure the next two meetings incorporating, we also, by the way, could have Jim's evaluation next meeting as opposed to a June meeting. And some of it would maybe depend on your availability, Mary. Yeah, I can't come to a May or June meeting. Neither, no matter when. Well, not the 8th, the 15th of May, and then about three weeks in June. Okay, so, <clears throat> so no, but that would be, I so take that as a no. So at the July yeah. meeting, you're all set. <laughs> right, um, so anyway, that, I've said enough comments on those things. They're all sort of rapid. Um, well, the first one, I, I disagree with your assertion that as a matter of policy, we shouldn't have a meeting the day after the election. I think if there were not just contested, but elections where the results were not known, I could see that argument. We're yeah. not certified. But when in Carlisle had we not had a school committee election certified uh, before no, but that's not why I'm approaching. I'm just saying. And, and, and I think if the, if the meeting is posted, then all candidates would know when the meeting was. It's not. That's not because they're scheduled. For. I don't care to debate it. My opinion is. For what reason then? Uh, because there are issues like who's going to be in region, who's going to do what. You make those decisions at the first meeting. These people have had, in that case, 24 hours to absorb whether they even are on committee, and right away we're deciding at that meeting what they're going to do for the following year. I, 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 I don't had know. more than 24 hours, Dave. No, it doesn't matter. It's not germane to this, this election. But I disagree with you. I think it's a poor practice. I think we should put a week separation generally between the election and the first school committee meeting of the new committee. We don't have to do it now. I just believe that. I'm that's available good. either week in May. I'm available both weeks in June. Yep. I will come for a superintendent evaluation. Yep. And Having said my piece, yeah, and and would, what do you think about either? They're not mutually exclusive. Splitting student, breaking up student presentations into two parts, and or moving eval to earlier to clear out more time in June for the student presentation. My only concern about moving eval earlier is that we were late in setting Jim's goals. Right, and if we're late in setting the goals and early in the evaluation, we're really evaluating just a few months of the year. Okay, fair statement. So, um, sorry, I was gonna go back because I realized, um, can you look at the, I don't have the regional school committee's meet, May meeting. Or I don't, can you go to that website? Did you look that up, Eva, today? Or, because those, I think that may be one of the reasons we tie the first okay. school committee meeting here so close to the election because we got a sense of to the region. Good point. Yep. Um, and I don't have that in my calendar when that, that may be. So when I was running for school committee, by the time of the election, I had a pretty good grasp of what the different roles were on the committee. Yep. And so nothing surprised me on the first day yep. when okay. the next right. day. So. That's good input. What do you think about, you know, sequencing? I mean, Jim makes it, I mean, sorry, Josh makes a good point about uh, Jim should be evaluated in June. I agree with that. Okay. And should presentations yeah. then be split May and June, or? I, um, are you thinking because of the? Well, just because it's a lot, I mean. A lot. What happens is you get a very long meeting in June if you do all the presentations. I think and some of those things evaluation. are still happening in May, and I think, you know, by June, the, all those student presentations are ready, but I think it might not What's be. What's the June date? June meeting? date is, June date is, I think it's the 10th. Uh, because graduation and school's going to get up pretty early. I think it's the 12th. It's the 12th and then graduation's the 14th. What time is the 13th? 13th. 14th. Graduation's no, the 14th. Joint. 
Oh, oh, joint, May 28th. So the June meeting. So Friday the 14th is graduation, Wednesday, June 12th. Graduation is the 13th, that's 630. That's the Thursday. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. Well, so it's it's day day It'd be like two nights. So that's not so right. That's why that's, we're looking at That's maybe not so great either. Yeah. What is, teachers don't have to answer if they don't want to, but what would, like Valerie, maybe you could answer. Yeah, what would be the impact of maybe having some of the, Presentations well, in May. Well, it's pretty late right now, so I would like to know so that I can have. Okay, so you need ready. you need how much? Well, I don't know. It, it depends. I mean, okay. April vacation is next week, so. Yeah, right. So that's another consideration. Not enough time to prepare. Okay. okay. It's, it, it was a very ceremonial. It yeah. was really okay. nice to have them. I'm just ready. Okay, I think those are good inputs. Um, what, so what are the so regionals? April, April 23rd okay. and May 28th. So like. So we're okay. Yeah, I, like I, my right. guess is we never go a month. They're scheduled that way. We quite often. Yeah, it's every two weeks. Ago. They they end up sticking a joint meeting in between. Okay. But, but, but that's okay. All right. So what I'm hearing is we'll stick with the schedule. We're going to stick with the schedule. Unless you want to have um, another school committee meeting before the election. I don't. Then we can keep get Mary and Josh back. We'll for just force, force them. <laughs> we already said goodbye. What do you mean? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, it's 10 of them. I, mean, I, I think that's it. I'm, 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 I think we got good input on that. We'll just leave, it, leave the calendar the way it is. So I pre so appreciate the input. Uh, did you make a decision on when we'll do Jim's review in June? We'll do Jim's review in June. We'll do okay. presentations in June. Uh, to give uh, Valerie and company adequate preparation time. I think that's important. And um, uh, we won't worry about the intersection of region. We'll have enough. We know the members. We, I've talked to the members, so we will be in an orderly way. We will, in a May meeting, define, de that, yeah. decide who's doing what, and then plenty of time for people to go to the region. Um, so, okay. Can we just real? Uh, can we talk about how we're going to do Jim's review? Are we going sure. to send things to you? How? Uh, because to ask Nancy I would that. like to contribute to it, but right. I'm not sure I can play a role fast. Well, you do a written I mean, one. You may not be there yeah. to present it, right? But we can read it in. Right. That's why I want to understand what, sure how we plan we'll to do, do it. Yeah. And then I just want to fill it up. And you're going to consolidate it, or how? I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember, remember the mechanics, but we'll we'll do it the way we do it. But we generally have okay. the people come back to read their own review, but if you're not here, we can read it. Okay. At least the general comments. Okay. 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 So just so I'm clear, did we change the maybe? We changed stuff? nothing. We changed, changed nothing. nothing. <laughs> Everything is status quo. The more time you spend, the less change. Understood. Okay. Uh, we've cut short the policies because we are definitely going to take a new approach to policies next year, and there was no point in bringing in lots of policies that we would debate at 9 o'clock. Um, but we do have two policies that we did debate last week, last meeting, that we made a few amendments to. And yes. Jim, you can speak to those. So everyone has the updated policies, I believe. Yes, yes. They, are, they are under your packet. Under it's the packet. The color. Okay. Yep. The color. With the red directions. Yep. From these, both of these, so we'll start with the uh, Carl Public Schools policy on drug and alcohol free workplaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, very timely after. This was vetted by the council and. He recommended we keep the language as is and that we would, because it does align more well with the federal regulations and we don't want to move outside of the federal regulations because of federal funding coming to this. So how does so it... Around that question of marijuana. Yes. It just, the language remains, the language remains the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unlawful manufacturing, distribution, dispensation, okay. possession, or use of controlled substance or alcohol is prohibited while on duty or a school property. So if one, if a student, and I can't imagine that, but if a student were prescribed marijuana for medical use, or a teacher for that matter, that would not be an unlawful right. It would be a lawful. Depends on which law is jurisdiction. So right at this point in time, we'd go with this language and make that determination, but we're looking at the the federal it reflects law. the federal law. Okay. But really, I mean, is it a state school, a school? But this, this is like, you, if you uh, go too far into it, we're back in the same. Okay. I mean, I presume we've surveyed before. MASC is sort of that. Yeah, language. so this is MASC language. This is what the council you know what? recommends. Tell us about vaping and so forth. Where are we on the next page? Yep. All right, on the next page, again, 
Same topic, the language was recommended by council just to add to him going nicotine, him going nicotine. Then But is vaping nicotine? There's nothing I'm in vaping. I'm so glad you asked that. Yeah. But so usually the, like the vaping component that yeah. you can vape a couple things. There's multiple things you can vape. So I think you can vape marijuana, and I think you can vape nicotine, and I think you can vape some other stuff. Well, you can vape dirty yeah. socks, I guess, but we don't yeah. know. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> so really, so, so, but we don't specifically say vaping. Right. Is that? Well, I don't think it cares about the dirty socks. Be the fact that Dave had to ask, and I had the same question. Yeah. Oh, we put the means, vaping. There's so a we lot put, of ignorance around vaping. My so we put the vaping it. in. There was another policy that we approved last time, which okay. spoke to what students could do. Oh, okay. And we put the vaping and the vaping paraphernalia into that, so it's prohibited from that. But it shouldn't, but then that leads why to another, but why is there a different policy for that? What policy is Because that? that's the policy on whether, what students... That's only students can't vape. Can so can Linda can vape, then, is what you're saying. No. You, no, because that's the Linda can't vape nicotine or any of the other things we just had mentioned because oh, it applies to everybody on school grounds. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. okay. So there's a couple of policies. One, yeah. one defines the workplace yeah. and the conditions thereof yeah. for our employees. So this one is... The one we approved last time was about students and what students can and cannot be in possession of and use and come to yeah. school events under the influence of. Okay. And then there's this one that just simply prohibit the, prohibited okay. the use of tobacco products yeah. on school grounds and because we wanted the ability to make sure that like nicotine also wouldn't be included, which kind of roundabout way comes at the vaping. But I don't know. There's something here where you can just put up a no smoking sign. Okay. This is why in the FC, they host it, you have student policies and yeah. you have right. staff policies. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Joshua, I spoke about tobacco. We have to, we have to change it. We have to change that. We have to change that. So we'll, 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 we'll approach policy. I think policies. I should just say that nobody's allowed to smoke or, or use nicotine products on school property. I know, but it's a crazy quilt now. Whether you're a student or you're a teacher, or it's vaping or it's something. Well, that's it's like it's not clean. It's, and nobody. To, it's not. And we'll we'll, we'll approach this and we'll tick the box. But so I think why we need separate policy. We need separate policy. <laughs> we got to figure out a better. No, we need separate policy. Meetings. One of the things I would like us to tackle in our summer session is how do we want to Approach policies. It's yeah. got. There's got to be. But but ones. but you, what you will, I think, and I'm a novice to this. Yeah. I think you'll find that districts or the MASC have, have multiple policies, even though they are they're layered and they may overlap. I think looking for one clean policy that's going to address both the workplace and address. No, we're not saying that. We're saying like what I think somebody over here said is we really should have. There should Categories. be workplace. There's like. You know, an employee handbook, and then there's a student handbook, right? Well, we don't have an employee handbook. But maybe we should. Um, I don't know. But I, mean, I think we just, the, what we do, give the employees the policies. But if this policy says no smoking or use of tobacco or nicotine by anybody, you don't need two separate ones for one right. for so, students. Right. Just so one policy. Right. Okay. I think okay. we... I yeah. think the federal law requires the workplace policy. Yeah, that, that's just... No, I know, but I'm just saying, this one covers nicotine. This one is also... Well, also, students, students, are students are from, oh, prevented yeah, yeah. from possession. Employees are not prevented from possession. Just use. Okay. So there's a better there's a better solution ahead, but for now, I think, at least for me, I've had enough of this. <laughs> Any more uh, questions on this? Um, okay. Uh, Jim, you want to speed through your superintendent's Can report? I just go back? Sorry. Yeah. Would you, Jim, maybe you talk to Lori or about how we've done it at the region, the whole policy and how, you know, as input to the Yeah, study. so I've talked to her just, and just, knowing that, so that and you and know, I how to you about the and the How do they do it? That's a long conversation. Okay. But we had that but, at the last, we talked about that at the last one. We talked yeah. about the subcommittee and the possibility yeah. of going that so just, Okay. Something to think about. So let's let's make one of the agendas for the summer to kind of understand that and figure out a better way to go at it. Okay. Sounds good. Superintendent's right. report. Oh, communications. Communications. Do anything of note? Okay. Um, there is a, there is um, the Carlisle Conservation Foundation and the Carlisle Trails Committee are planning um, Carlisle Trails Day, like the community challenge, mm -hmm. to get as many people out on Saturday, May 18th, to walk, and we collectively in Carlisle walk all the trails. Okay. So um, you're, the CCF generously donated trails, books, 
um, to the middle school and families. Um, and I think to the all families okay. in the middle school. Middle school? He went to every family. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Right? He went to every family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I believe they were talking about um, donating also um, Trails books for the teachers. They came today. They did. Okay. okay. Um, so they would like, you know, to get the word out as much as possible about okay. this. They're discriminating against the empty nest baby boomers that John Valentine talked about. Right? Well, they can show up too. <laughs> I bought one up there. I'm trying to get the word out in other this venues as well, but uh, it's relevant awesome. here because I think you know when the time when you know, timing, you can send an email to right? families about this. And you can put it in the bus. Put it in the mosquito. Yeah, I think uh, I think yeah. they're putting out. We we've shared it through our principals. Yes. Yeah. Our okay. principals' newsletters. We're going to share them all with the faculty, yeah. give them the books. Do it again when it's time. See if we can encourage some yeah. interconnection of curriculum and. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. And do trails. Yeah. Okay. They can bring their nature journals. Hmm? The feasibility of it. No. Try to walk no. all of Carlisle's trails in one day, but not everybody. Just pick one trail. Oh, okay. So, uh, Seventy or hundred miles of trails. I. I can't walk that far in one day. There's a group of guys that drive half on it. They do a day. There's a whole bunch of trails that are on trail uh, access okay. easements on. All right. Right. Let's move on. All right, would you like a, a brief yes. update? We want the brief update. Uh, so um, we have been working on a student support services direct search. So we've formed the search committee, identified members for that. We've had the have faculty. You already? Yes. I thought we were going to discuss who's on there. What? Who's on the search committee? Have you already identified that? We've identified parents and okay. faculty. Administration, and I thought it was you. It is me, but then a second one. Okay, we'll be open to that. Okay, I think um, I March spoke 23rd. to Ms. Mustafi as a as a potential school committee member. I would like her to be. Morning meeting, unfortunately, yes. That's okay. I'll put you on the mail it for March twenty third. It's the first okay, meeting. Very good. May. Um, May. What day? We'll May. I hope April, it's May. April twenty third. April twenty third. April twenty third. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. so what time is the uh, I'll have to check. Okay, you'll send something out. I'll send something out with the search. Okay, right. first. Okay. Third base. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nancy's well, got it all out. <laughs> well, I think because I, I spoke to Eva and, and uh, she has interest in that, and I think it would be great to get uh, her involved. That'd be great. Well, so thank you for volunteering. It's an inclusive committee. So we, we have a meeting. We've met with the faculty, met with the parents. We had a survey go out to parents who couldn't make it. We got input from 18 parents via the Google Doc. Okay. So we're being able to comprise that information and we'll be reposting tomorrow with some updated job description so that we can gather more interest. And then we'll share out all the data we gathered with the search committee on the 23rd. Okay, good. And then we'll also screen, we'll screen applications at that time and identify people that we'll be having for interviews the following weeks. Okay. Um, we also had our fourth grade meeting, uh, I'm meeting with the fourth grade parents and discuss the transition to the triad of fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And I do want to thank our fifth grade team members for attending those meetings. Thank you, Jen, attended all three of those. Um, and, uh, and, uh, stand up, we can't see you. Um, Mimi was there too. I gave Jen the shout out because she was at all three. Jen. Oh, oh, three of those. But I appreciate you coming too, Mimi. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and, every, every, and everyone came to couple of them so that was, that was great um, we had on Wednesday March I'm back to yeah, March 27 March. yes March. Josh was at the mechanics hall performance now I do probably wish in April yeah. so our student chorus and band to fund the mechanics hall right. not here it now. was I wonderful really um, yeah. all reports were outstanding that the students had an amazing experience and the venue was fabulous and thank you to, to Valerie and Kevin for making that trip possible yeah. and all the parent volunteers who also kind of made that happen so thank you. Um, a couple of master planning meetings over the last couple of weeks. And uh, again, John presented uh, the trends data at one of the master planning meetings. They had the master planning advisory committee met last week and is just looking to encourage people to make sure to go out and support um, the Warren articles to yep. support the master planning project. The other thing about the presentation that he gave tonight, that was half of it, right? The other half that he gave to the larger group had um, financial data as well. So I think people can go to the website, uh, carlileplan.org, right. I believe, and they can see the full presentation. I think it's there. in the packet as well. If they're website. interested. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Then just a couple other items. We had, um, the CF had a fundraiser this past yeah. Saturday night for excellent. the Performing mm -hmm. Arts Studio, which was well yeah. attended. And I think they yeah, Sarah was here earlier, but uh, the, Wilson, uh, 
the Wilson Angelino family did a great, just a beautiful job. It was a good turnout there. Yeah. We also have the book fair. PTO book fair is going yeah. on currently. Yeah. And if you haven't been to the book fair, I encourage people to go to the book fair tomorrow. Yeah. I think it's running through Friday, so yeah. get out there and buy some books and support the PTO. And then um, next week is April vacation, so ah. hopefully everyone will enjoy the break. And then we'll see you the next week. Okay, thank you. Sorry about Mechanics Hall, you didn't mention Micah. I apologize. So Micah, our performers, got, uh, I think they received silver and silver. Yeah. And silver was a step, like, they were aspiring to silver in one of the bands and they, they made it in silver. They've historically gotten the other groups, so that was impressive. That's awesome. So Kevin was very pleased with that performance. That had a big impact on the Cub Scout, Boy Scout hike, because all the Micah had kids home. had to go home. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, committee reports? Uh, the region, yeah. any minute now, could be voting on the, right. the parking and paving. We're not going to patch um, Christine in. Right? Oh, right. So the, the town meeting, they didn't vote on that last night. No, this they is their third, third night of town meeting. Right. And that's why Christine had to leave. God bless oh, Concord. Okay. To get so over right. there. Vote on that tonight. We hope. And I will she got tell you, out. the update is that FinCom took a position of not, not supporting, not supporting our FinCom. Our FinCom. Yeah. Carl Alfin. And last night, Board of Selectmen uh, chose to defer taking a position. Yeah. To when? Well, so the meeting, the they're meeting on the 23rd. So now, did they take one on now? Or they're uh, waiting? So we asked the Selectmen not to take a position. I see. Okay. Because they were meeting. We thought the article was going to get voted at Concord see. last night, the same time that the Selectmen okay. were meeting. So we were like, just hold off. Okay. And um, the amount has changed to 1.7 instead of 2 million, roughly. I don't have it exactly, but it's 1.7 million. The ask is a little different. So, okay. and then the Carlisle FinCom voted against it. The Concord, I'm not, I can't remember if it was, I think it was the Select, Concord Selectman voted 3 to 2 in favor of it. Barely in favor. Yeah. And what so, about the FinCom? I can't remember. Okay. I don't know. Okay. But so the, we'll find out tonight what happens there. But they've taken a there. risky position of not bifurcating. Yeah, and We're there was a lot of back and forth on whether you could or couldn't. We couldn't yeah. change it. Oh, we can't. No, it's so, no. Okay. And that there's no, um, it's a yes or no vote tonight. There's no yeah. changing. Someone right. could, you know, try to split it or whatever on the floor. No. Yeah. Okay. So I was kind of I'm waiting sure for see. text to come through and see what happens. Yeah. There's another parking lot that needs to be paved. Yep. Yeah. Right. Have um, they thought about solar? Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, been a lot yeah, of talk about solar, but apparently the CMLP, the Contra light plant, yeah. can't take well, it they, have, they can't handle the capacity. Supplies. And yeah. there's, there's, the high school building was designed to put solar panels on the roof, yeah. and we haven't done it because they can't handle it. So. Okay. Yeah, so it's all kind of okay. Josh, you um, That's all that's really going on there. Um, Long-term capital requirements approved the Warren article as published, yep. including the Running right. for the items yep. as reduced to requested by the school. Yep. Um, Municipal Facilities Committee meets very frequently, um, and uh, <coughs> basic updates are the proposed changes to the fire station and fire trailer uh, that we were waiting to have a new fire chief. He has now asked for several months to consider what his needs are before mm -hmm. we. So it won't be this cycle. It, it won't be this cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, although we've already appropriated money for it, but we can. Yeah. It doesn't turn into a pumpkin yet. Okay. Um, uh, the underground storage tanks are out from under the, uh, the the big storage tanks for the gas and diesel at the fire station are out. The contamination is limited, right. and uh, we're developing a plan together with Board of Health for how that continues to get monitored. We still have to remove a storage tank for a diesel storage tank under the generator and uh, put a new storage tank for diesel. Um, for the generator that the fire chief would like to use for fueling as well, but the selectmen said they don't, he doesn't need it, so the municipal facilities committee has backed off from that fight and said um, we'll, we'll do whatever we're told. But um, that's where that one stands. Most of the effort's gone into police station at this point, yeah. um, where uh, we're working through the details of what we're going to present on uh, April 24th. There will be a meeting at town hall to go over the details of the fire of the police station renovation. And then the following Saturday, an open house at the police station 
so uh, citizens can tour the facility and see what the proposed changes might, might entail. Okay. Um, and that plan is going for historic commission um, mm -hmm. this week, I think, uh, together with 3D uh, images of what the proposed garage would look like. Okay. So that's uh, those two committees. Good. In a nutshell. Are you retiring from those two committees? I am, yes. It's sabbatical anyways. So Jim, I'm going to put April 23rd. That's you don't know the time yet, but that's going to be the, the meeting of the search committee. Right? Yes. Yeah, I do have one more thing to do. Yes, sir. So we did request that the board of selectmen review the charter for the um, municipal facilities committee and mm -hmm. consider expanding it to include some role with the school and in the process give the school some seat at the table. Mm -hmm. um, so that hasn't, to my knowledge, happened yet, but that is in process. Are we involving Rob Fortado in that? He is a uh, ex officio member of the committee, okay. but we're talking about uh, school committee representation mm -hmm. on the facilities committee. And this is because okay. when a capital request for school building comes before yeah. long term capital requirements, the facilities committee is their expert arm yeah. to do evaluation, yeah. well, and it would sense. be inappropriate to have that um, body not have school representation okay. if it's evaluating school requests. Okay. So I requested that they consider how to, how to get school involved in that. Okay. All right. Good. 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, warrant article. It, Nancy's not here. And who signs them these days? Nancy's. Oh, I mean, not Nancy. Sue's not here. Sorry. Uh, Melinda signs them. Okay. They're all signed. So it's, we don't need. Do we have to read this in or not? No. Okay. They're, it's the ones that are already Okay. In. All right, so let's move to action items. We have to wait for the end of the uh, So any citizens' comments while I'm waiting? No? Okay. Did you get back from the airport okay? All right, excellent. Do we have a vote for the school choice? Uh, we're going to vote. Yeah, do we have language, Nancy, for the vote for school choice? I, uh, I remember rough language. Thank you, Josh. I, I move that the, the district not uh, opt for school choice in the coming year for reasons of space. I'll okay. second. Any f discussion? Yes, I, I want to say that in principle I'm strongly a proponent of school choice. Um, I believe this committee and this town should send a message to the state that the funding uh, by law is not conducive to support a school choice. That if the funding fully encompassed the uh, both the per pupil costs yeah. that we sent to DESE, as well as the capital costs, as well as any pension costs, yeah. um, and, and encompass the full cost of educating a student, that it would be a wise thing for Carlisle to do to participate in school choice. And until then, it is foolish. So you're saying it's quite a stretch, right? But, but saying, that's what the message should be. It's a, yeah, it's a financial, not a uh, sociological. Oh, it's sociologically, I fully endorse it. But don't right. penalize the town for doing the right thing. Right, right. And that's what short of full funding does: is it penalizes the town. Right. right. Yeah. Melinda, we started the process of voting, uh, taking a vote on school choice. Yeah. I, your, your motion is to vote no, right? Yeah. That's correct. Motion to no is on the table. Uh, second. Well, it's been second. Do you have no, any We're comments? discussing any, okay. any discussion. <laughs> you got to keep up. Right? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, I thought right. we were doing warrants. Uh, we did we them, did those I think. really quickly. Okay. okay. Um, any comments on school choice? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the financially, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. 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 And there's an additional administrative burden, all of the other things yeah. that Josh mentioned. Um, yeah. Somewhat unpredictable in terms of special education. We also have to put more significant cost. We don't know. Okay. What about the uh, do we need a roll call vote on that, Nancy? Yes, for the school choice. So vote is to, the, I, uh, I, an affirmative vote means voting no, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have an aye? Stores aye. Mode aye. Good luck to aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, the next one is a vote to approve, approve the superintendent's contract. We have negotiated a new contract for Jim. Did we already sign it? We signed it, but I'm told okay, that we need to take a, yeah. <laughs> we need to take a, um, I don't know, Nancy knows the date. It I'm starts July 1, 2019. 19. Yep. Right. It goes June to four years. 
Okay. I okay. move to approve the superintendent's contract. Second. Any discussion? Thank you, Jim. Congratulations. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Congratulations. Can be no aye. I think you just, just oh. all in favor say aye. Oh, aye. 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 Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Uh, next is a vote appointment of special legal counsel to address a special education matter. Um, without going into details, we have a separate special education attorney apart from our uh, school counsel. That we have a matter in front of us uh, where another town is involved, and it turns out that that attorney also represents that town, so he needed to recuse himself mm. from our advocacy. And we have reached out to Andy's firm. Yes. Has he been in contact with someone? And uh, have we selected one to approve, or we just well, select we, the firm? We picked the firm. Right? We picked the firm, and then we picked. I the think firm. pick the firm would be fine okay. right now. I'm not, I'm not sure how far we will have to go with this. Well, right, but I mean, there's a question then about whether we just stick with that council mm -hmm. for the special education. In other words, if we switch, we switch for good? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're not ready to go into that. No, this but for this particular matter. For this particular matter. So it's a one-off at the moment. At what point did we find out that this was a, it was a need to be for the person to recuse themselves or the firm to recuse themselves? Well, we, we knew it was a thank concern. You, thanks for your intervention on the matter that brought it to my attention. And further investigation indicated that it was not a closed issue. And so I reached out to that counsel, and he informed me that he couldn't represent us because of the conflict. Did he give advice before about it? He gave advice, but he can't represent us. Did, did we ask how he chose them over us? I was just I, you know what? <laughs> I, I believe we should review We're the choice ones of the We have the concern. <laughs> I, believe it, I believe a review of who is our... Bed council is warranted. However, that's not what's in front of us right now. Correct. What's in front of us, to answer your question, is he did immediately disclose it. We immediately decided, oops, we can't have that guy be our representative. And so here we are. So, so do you need a motion? So uh, yes. Can I? So, can go, I go ahead. I just, like this kind of thing, if we could, and it's not for me to say anymore, but no, sure. you should have, you should have the, the vote, the language of the vote of all of these. Oh, right. it's because it's okay. like there should be the name of the firm. There shouldn't be any, I like what do we, such and such you should know what to move. Should be, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, so, I think we should have that. Okay. Just the name of the firm is Murphy, Hesse, Toomey, Lahane. Murphy, Hesse, Toomey, Lahane. So the motion would say that we move to have counsel selected from the firm of Murphy, Hesse, Toomey, Lahane represent Carlisle School District on this particular special education matter. So moved. Second. Discussion. I, I agree, Dave. It's time to read this. Definitely have to read All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay. Uh, next is the solar project, which Melinda, That's you must have planning. made. You know, oh, I'm sorry. Vote to support master plan. It now, is. Oh, I have, the, I have an absolute. Uh, what, uh, I'm sorry. Now, what would probably be a good idea, and no, I'm not looking at my, I'm not checking my email. I'm going to look mm -hmm. for the, I have the warrant language, unless somebody else has it. The, the warrant is in the, I don't know, the motion part of the warrant. But I mean, we're, we're, we would, the vote would be to support all three, or? Well, are we going to do master plan first? Oh, master plan. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. I didn't know if people wanted to actually read the actual warrant article. Right. You know, they're asking for a hundred thousand. One hundred sixty thousand. Yeah. Um, that is to fund the work of the consulting firm. Yeah. Um, as well as um, supplemental costs that will be incurred by the town through the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So our position would be, I think, that a um, to support that would be to the benefit of the schools. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's my that's my feeling. Right. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion. Is that a motion? I'll make a motion. Um, the school committee take a position to support warrant article, whichever one it is, for master plan number twelve, maybe master plan steering committee's um, warrant article for one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Second. Further discussion? 
You should get the correct one. I don't know if it's in. The, I don't know if I put it in this little packet or not. I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll get it into the motion, but. Um, Okay, any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Josh? Aye. Aye. Okay. Still and on. it so is Article Number 12. Article 12, okay, very good, thank you. Funding for town okay. master plan. Now we have the solar, and do you want to take them as three separate or one or all three together? Um, there are three separate war articles. There they're all interdependent or interrelated, so yeah. it's uh, to, you know, however procedurally you want to do it. Well, we can make you. a motion to support um, articles 20. So what is the bylaw? Yeah, the bylaw amendments. It's, it's 24, 25, and 26. 26. Right. Um, the t Article 24, amend the Carlisle Zoning Bylaws, Section 5.8, Revisions to Solar District. This is the um, yeah. amendments that we talked about adding the school parcel, um, talking about the height for the canopy, mm -hmm. and the, wave, the um, waiving the 40-foot setback if abutting land is owned by the town or the same entity. Okay. Those are the changes. Article, should we do them one by one, or just all three? Take them all together. Well, I, so I, I'm trying, I'm, this is Bob, this, so one is, just bigger picture, one is to, I'm trying to avoid us weighing in on political matters that aren't have, don't have a direct impact to the school. Well, this so this that school, does right. right that clearly. And does. the other two, one is the second one the is two. for um, the lease providing support for the school committee to enter into a lease agreement yeah. with NRSCO and the right. you know, right. accept the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, yep. And the third one is the school the yep. so the CPS okay. parking lot. Yeah. So they're all make sure I have those straight. Okay. okay. So, so they all so, impact so school. Taking them as a package seems fine. Yes. So um, I make a motion that the school committee vote to support articles 24, 25, and 26. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Now, yes. I uh, <coughs> didn't see this on here, but I wanted to take a position on the complete streets for an article. This, that was to um, for pedestrian safety improvements. Wow. On the, at the crosswalks. Okay. I'm trying. Have we been presented with that? Yeah, I don't think we can take we that up right now. We may have a discussion. People need to get these things in ahead of time for us to prepare. So let's let's uh, not engage in that um, right now. I'll just throw out there that the school committee usually convenes on the night of town meeting. Yes, and we do probably we will that? do. We you already put a placeholder in, right? For. 6 p.m. on the 29th, I think, Nancy. But if we're not going to have a presentation of it, well, well, we can gather it. We can decide. Well, and it. you inform us. <laughs> All right. So what do you? Either tonight or tomorrow. Well, if we can do it now, we can avoid a meeting. So right. what? What do we need to know about it? Um, all right. So this warrant article is number. 13, Town of Carlisle Complete Streets and Crosswalk Safety Enhancements. Okay. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate borrow or transfer from available funds a sum of $50,000 for the purpose of supplementing the funding for the Complete Streets project and implementing crosswalk safety recommendations such as those outlined in the Stamps Unit McNary Engineering Report titled Crosswalk Safety Enhancements, dated November 26th. The article number is? Article number 13. Okay. So these are funds that will supplement the Complete Streets grant that we were recently awarded. Yep. Um, they are specifically for supplementing Complete Streets and implementing crosswalk safety enhancements at okay. Vanta Davis Crosswalk and the one at 142 Bedford Road where we've had okay. incidents, pedestrian incidents. So, so does that have anything to the school? Well, it does because the Band. kids are kids are near there and school property. On the other hand, I would object on the basis that we have not waived our practice of bringing up a oh, matter at one meeting. I'd vote, a town, I'd vote the night of town meeting. Okay. So, so discuss that, tonight. May, may I request yeah. that we have a more formal presentation details before the vote? Oh, yeah. 
have to put one together for town meeting anyway. So I, I can practice Are you, it. You're I the, can uh, practice uh, it on you. <laughs> okay. So would it be one that we send around electronically just so people are aware of it? Or do you want a presentation at... I'd like the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, well, you will, but should Melinda... I'd like for, too, if you need to ask questions before we vote on the school committee, whether we support the article. No, I get it. But I'm saying from a process standpoint, Melinda can send the presentation electronically to us so we're, we have read it. That's a short meeting in the cafeteria, right? Yeah. So we will have read the presentation you'll send. We can, we can deliberate at the meeting mm -hmm. and take a vote. So there will be a school committee meeting at 6 o'clock on the 20th. 6, 6.30, I don't know. On the 20th. Yeah, it's 29th. easy for me to say. 29th. Yeah, 29th. So are you going to that? School, the uh, town meeting? Yeah. Okay. Quite. We will have a quorum. Okay. You, even if I were So this isn't our last meeting? I guess not. Then. So they have to do that all again. Yeah, we have to get you. <laughs> do I have to give back the bag? <laughs> we'll get you now. We'll get you now. Get you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I okay, just good. I've never really So we'll, well, that'll be for uh, the agenda for um, that meeting. And okay. Yeah, just make sure you get it on the and agenda. And that's 6 p.m. 429. Okay, great. What did you say, 6 o'clock? I guess 6 or 6 too early. 6.30? I don't really care. What else do we need to... Nothing. 6.30. Anything else to take positions on? I don't know. It comes out of the woodwork. But let's just say 6.30 for now. Are we going to take a position about the Spalding Field? Right now we are. We may. I mean, about the warrant support for the warrant article. Yes, on the Spalding study. Article 30. Which is to support the study. Okay of the Spalding Fields, which we have discussed in the previous meeting. So uh, somebody want to move on that one? I want to make a motion um, that the school committee support support Article 30, Spalding Field Study. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, and now we have uh, oh, okay, then on now having said that, we also have a vote on the, to al um, allow the rec committee to have oversight on the, it says here delegate Spalding Field oversight, but what that should read is Spalding Field study oversight to recreation. That's committee. a huge difference. Yeah, that's a really <laughs> that's big, a big difference. difference. <laughs> I know, well, that's why Melissa pointed that out to me and I didn't realize that. That's what we meant to say. Study. So yeah. we're just giving them the oversight of the motion study, language is really yeah. good not that. of the field. Yes. Yeah. Have we talked about this before? We did. Yeah. Okay. We talked about. Did we talk about the study? Did we talk about delegating oversight of the study? We did. I feel like no, we, you feel like we, we're trying to question out there. Okay, yeah, like, do this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think well, that's what we did. Up, well, she said, who's going to do this? Who's control and all did that? Did you yeah. talk about it when he was on the... Well, we talked about managing the study, but yeah. maybe we didn't do for that. So, if you want, we can tack it on to the... We don't actually have to decide now. It's actually not something we have to decide, because the study has to, to get passed, yeah. and yeah, then yeah, we yeah. can decide. So, why rush on this? Fine, table it. I got it. Sounds good to me. We will, we will not move on that vote. Now we will move on the, as Josh's final Come on, policy Come on, decision. I will grant you the honor of making a motion on one or both of these policies. I move to reject the proposed policy on drug and alcohol-free workplace, as it is ambiguous as to which law applies when the statement unlawful is written. And therefore, the policy that is ambiguous can't reasonably be enforced. We're going to miss you so much. <laughs> well, are you, so you're rejecting, or are we going to try to send it back for editing? I was asked to make a motion on the policy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reject it? Your motion was to reject, clearly. OK. Because so. usually we'll say, this isn't ready yet. Okay, okay, so not so. Right, so maybe I should have said before you make a motion. Should we? He already did. Okay, so the motion's on the table. Nobody has to but second. But somebody has to second it. But if nobody seconds it, it doesn't go anywhere. 
Which is the same thing as rejecting. Right. right. So now that we but didn't second it, let me ask it differently. Would you find it acceptable if we referenced federal law? I would prefer that Which we reference state law. That, and that gets into a legal pickle which we can't answer tonight, right? Correct. And we go back to our so it sounds like we're going council and have them help us craft language that would do that. Well, or really not, not a matter if of If everybody else language. is in agreement with that, like, so before we go and craft language to that effect, whatever would... Well, would it's, not, but I'm looking for, it's not a matter of crafting language. It's a matter of it's the pickle we're in. In other words, if you violate federal law, you can be ineligible for some, you know, grant if, if by the time Betsy DeVos is done, there is any DOE to worry about. <laughs> then, you know. <laughs> we'll be right. turned into a charter school by then. Right. But if you violate, if you go with federal law, but you're crosswise with state law, that's not great. We're a state, you know, we're part of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So. There's a matter of legal, there's a legal matter that has nothing to do with drafting language that should be resolved. Then there's drafting. Are we, are there so is the, legal, um, is the legal matter the, the reference to enforcement? To which, which law should we, be decided? We use the statement unlawful, yet we don't describe which law applies. Isn't it the Drug Free, Free Workplace Act of 1988? Um, That's a federal law, but it's... Oh, you're saying, okay. But it's been... I mean, I don't know what the I don't know what's going on at the MGL, but I imagine they yeah, but carved something out. Right? <laughs> it's nine thirty-one. How long would we like to discuss this? Well, there's, well, there's, there's no really motion. early. We didn't no motion. Right. Historic No, I'm saying. Yeah, we, I mean, <laughs> we're not conquered after all. What we've done recently is where we where we run into these complicated little issues with regard to policies. We just don't think of changing the policy. And I'm okay with that, because we have a big overhang of policies that we've done that with, and maybe we should just add this to the file, because we clearly have work to do to understand mm -hmm. what the role of policy and, is. And if, if, if we're comfortable that the staff is not smoking and drinking on campus, I think we could delay this without a I'm big fine. impact. I'm fine with that. Has that been a big problem, Jim? Do you have an enforcement issues, Jim? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Okay. No, I don't see it. I had to get my parting yes. shot in. I'm good with it. I move to. Oh. Uh, can I just give. I'm oh, sorry, you've. You sorry, we want to withdraw my motion. Oh, okay. okay. It becomes irrelevant, and then okay. move to the next one, but go ahead. Oh, I want to give an a update. Yeah, go ahead. From Christine. Ah, yes. The parking and paving article didn't pass. Oh, okay. But it, they had to do a count, a roll count. It so we're, so out of, we're off the hook. We don't have yeah. to do anything. Did you see how many voters even showed up? I didn't Third know they had a quorum, but, but they, had to, um, they had to get a quorum. Right? They had to count. It was so close. She said oh. there was a lot. So she's on an hour of discussion by 12 votes. <gasps> wow. wow. 12 votes. Okay. Print that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. So I even Concord didn't it. support its own. They overreached. We knew that. Okay. Um, um, do you want Christine to come back? Or she uh, can, no. she, we'll get her on the phone. This is on our way home anyways, isn't it? She should drive home, and if she's here, we can put her on the phone, right? We can put her on the phone. She wants to call in. Yeah, we'll, we'll have her call her. Can we her. call her? We'll, we'll have to call her. We'll do it in executive. Okay. We, we don't I'll need to yeah, right just, just tell her to call her. Okay. 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 Do we have anything else? Yeah, yeah. I have a motion. Make oh, motion. I move to accept the proposed policy on tobacco and nicotine oh, products. Yes. Sorry. And Mary, Mary said okay. don't do it. I thought we were skipping both of those. You don't so. both of them? Okay. I withdraw my Well, mind. I don't. Okay. You're rejecting and withdrawing. You're making mine. All right. I'm listening to my fellow committee. May members. I have a motion to adjourn to executive session pursuant to MGL Chapter 38, Section 20 May. May I bring up one more thing, though? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, not that I want us to take a position on it, but it was presented to us today and suggested that we take a position on the uh, recreational marijuana bylaw. Oh, you're right. We didn't take right. a position. And right. um, we given that we talked about it today, we shouldn't vote on it until next time. Right. But I just wanted to say I'm opposed to us taking a position on that. Because? 
Um, well, a few reasons. First, the, there already are state protections for school, and yeah. you make the point that we shouldn't weigh in on purely political matters. Yeah. Second, to the extent that we took a position, I think it would, should recognize two factors. First of all, that the, the town did vote a majority to support right. recreational yeah, marijuana. Right. It, is, it is hypocritical yeah. to then say, but not here, thank you. And, <laughs> yeah, we do that all the time, though. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then secondly, um, that if we look at the health of our kids, one of the greatest threats they face uh, is the uh, opioid crisis. And the evidence shows that um, use of cannabis and legalization of cannabis has mitigated the uh, use, abuse, and overdose uh, on mm -hmm. opioids. I think it might be yeah. early to tell. I, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Too early to tell what the impact of that of the legalization. Oh, so did we take a position? I don't remember the school committee taking positions when Burns decided to sell another controlled substance. Yeah. Well, that's another reason not to take a position. Yeah. But so what yeah. I'm saying is. I, we shouldn't do it at this meeting regardless. Right. But right. even at the next meeting, okay. I would argue so we please, shouldn't take a position. Nancy, please add it. I think we should add it to the agenda and deliberate it, but we may yeah. decide not to take it. And, so, and that, that, right. Just because we don't take a position doesn't mean right. we can't explain it a little bit at right. town meeting. Right. Right. You know? Well, it doesn't why, mean, we it doesn't need to come why we didn't it take a position? Because, because, up, because when you don't take a position, it comes, comes off as if you don't support it. <laughs> I just take it. it to mean like you didn't think it was really relevant to your board. I'm comfortable with the statement of this committee took no position. Just not that we took a position opposing, not that we took a position yeah, for, but that no, we took no position. No, we took no position, yeah. Right, right. Okay. And, and also, um, you can opt to stand up and say we took a position, or you can opt not to stand up. At all. Right. Well, if we're called on, which we yeah. may yeah. say we took well, the position. Well, yeah, we just say, did any boards take right. a position? Okay. Uh, okay. Anything else before we have a motion to return to exec? Okay, once again, would anybody like I'll to make, make a, a motion? I'll make a motion to adjourn to executive session pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, with no intent to return to open session for the following purposes. Purpose three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body. And purpose seven, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, mass general laws, and in consideration of approval of, of executive session minutes from previous meetings. Second. Roll call vote. Gambino, aye. Stores, aye. Nordell, aye. Kablotsky, aye. Very good. Um, Do we need to say a not to return? We said a not to return. Not to return to, I'm sorry. She point, said a not of order. Yes. If we're going to call Christine, yep. we need to say she's going to participate, promote, and why, and all that. In executive. Or well, at any, at any point, right? I, I'm assuming. Before we call her, we have to say that. Okay. So you, you think we need when to say she, that before we return yeah, to executive right, session? When somebody's going to participate remotely, you have to say why. And then they have okay. to be really. Well, I mean, that has to be so, on the record, or what are you saying? I don't know. Sure. Mm -hmm. Not and the it, expert, it, other than I, so when I participated remotely, we looked it up and it said you have to okay. say why that person. What? Yeah, she can't vote remotely. Yeah. That's okay. We didn't accept this. Okay, she doesn't need to vote. We are asking her to participate remotely because she's en route, is she? Well, we t I told her to go home because that's you what told you told her. Home? That's I what told you told her to me drive to tell towards us. home. We'll you know, call her. We'll we call her. We'll sort we're of. We're going to call her on her cell. We'll right? call her on her cell. Because if she can make it back, she can come in. That was my point. She drives right by us. She has been reunited at Concord Town meeting. Yeah, I know, but okay. Anyway, we're done. Thank you very much.